Well, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that uh, we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Lakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, now settlers from around the world. Do a roll call of council members, Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Councillor Knack. Can you just let us triple check that um, those online can hear us? Oh. Cal Cal can uh, can you hear Knack, us? Can you hear us? Test. 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 Councillor Neck, uh, thank you for the chat. Can you hear us? No. Testing, Councillor Neck, can you hear us? Councillor Knack, can you hear us? Test. Testing, Councilor Nack, can you hear us? <music> Councilor Nack, can you hear us? Test. Success. Yeah, Councillor Knack, can you hear us? Loud and clear. Can anybody other than Councillor Knack hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear there you. There we go. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for your patience, Mayor Sohi. We're good to go. Everybody can hear us. All right, now we are ready to go. Councillor Knack, can you hear us? Can you give a thumbs up? Good morning. There we go. I'll start all over again so that everyone can hear. We'd like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the uh, traditional land of TD6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Lakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. Do a roll call, Councillor Wright. 
I'm still here. Good morning. <laughs> Consular Nag. Good morning. Consular Pinsby. Good morning. Consular Stevenson. Good morning. Consular Plaquette. Morning. Consular Tang. Good morning. Consular Hamilton. Good morning. Consular Rutherford. Morning. Okay. Consular Salvador. Good morning. Consular Cartmel. Tim might be joining us a little later on. Consular Rice. Good morning. And Consular Jans. Good morning. All right. So we we're done with the approval of the agenda and the minutes. I do have a protocol item. Uh, and before I do that, I want to thank uh, Councillor Cartmel. You know, he's not on uh, in the meeting with us yet. But this idea uh, came to him from um, some community members to uh, uh, mark the, uh, the first anniversary of the uh, uh, are unfortunately, right, the war in, war in Ukraine. So uh, idea came to him and he brought to uh, uh, my and Andre's attention and uh, so we thought we will do this protocol. I'll start on February 24th, 2022. One year ago today, Russia began its unprovoked attack on Ukraine. This marked the start of what has become a troubling series of events as the people of Ukraine faced a daily onslaught of aggression. Actions that have resulted in the deaths of thousands of innocent people and many more injured. Over the past 12 months, Ukraine's allies have responded with Canada and other countries around the world offering support in very various ways and opening their doors to displaced Ukrainian citizens. With a large community of Ukrainian Canadians here in Edmonton, our community has been especially touched by this war. Edmontonians have done all they can to offer support and open their homes, wallets, and hearts to the people of Ukraine. In the recognition of the anniversary of the Russian, Russia, Russia's invasion, City Hall will be participating in a grassroots initiative to mark the occasion. Joining municipalities and churches throughout Europe and Canada, today the city will ring the friendship clock tower chimes for 15 seconds at 11.58 a.m. There will then be a minute of silence, followed by 12 single rings of the bell starting at 12 noon to signify 12 months of unprovoked war. I know that all of city council and city administration and Edmontonians everywhere are thinking about our friends in Ukraine, particularly on this somber day. We wish them safety, resilience, and strength. And I also want to note that there are activities happening in the, in the community. I was just uh, at the Earl Buxton School, where kids uh, from grade three uh, are raising close to $1,000 by selling hot chocolate, and the money is going to go to uh, orphanages in Ukraine to help uh, displaced kids, right? So this uh, is really, really touching that kids are also getting involved in this, right? So, yeah, so we will probably break early, uh, about 11.50, then we'll go uh, to, the, to the clock tower to, uh, uh, to observe the ceremony. Okay, with that... Uh, We are on to 7.1, right? So just before you do that, we did receive two requests to speak. Okay. Uh, there, I believe, in front of you on the summary of agenda changes. Would you like to deal with that matter now, or would you like to deal with that when you get to item 8.1? We, we have a practice of not... Uh, hearing from uh, members of the public, uh, particularly when items are discussed at the committee. Uh, so I would not suggest that we break away from that, that practice. Uh, so if council doesn't have a desire to hear, then we don't have to make those amend uh, changes, right? That's correct, ma'am. Yeah, okay, I don't, I don't think we should do that. Okay, all right, okay. All right, now to 7.1.
Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Councillors. We're here today to provide you an update about work on Operating Budget Amendment 12, which instructed administration to reduce spending by $6 million, $60 million and reallocate or transition $240 million towards Council priorities. And I've got the, uh, the City's leadership team here today to help with the discussion and answer questions. Today I would propose that we cover the six items you see on this screen here. I will share some of the guiding principles we're using to make the decisions throughout the course of implementing this direction and would, uh, would like your commentary on that. I'm seeking your specific direction on two key elements, that is how we define core services and what is in scope for the review at this time. And we're going to propose to begin a review of council policies and we have a preliminary list and I invite your early feedback on this approach either today or, um, or, or outside this discussion on one-on-ones or other uh, avenues and also the questions we need to ask about those policies. I'll also give you an update on progress we've made so far and some examples of other upcoming work. So first, we've established to do this work, uh, these guiding principles to help drive some of the decisions. First and foremost, we will consider public and employee safety and we will continue to apply our broad understanding of safety, which includes wellness, psychological safety and all the elements of belonging. We will take an outcomes-based approach considering the risks and opportunities that changes create. We will also take a longer view and consider longer-term impacts of the decisions we made. And those, those two, uh, principle two and three, I would just put simply, we don't want to make a decision this year that we are likely or we could undo a year later. So we're trying to think longer term, so if we make a decision, uh, it, it at, la at least lasts uh, throughout the course of this four-year budget. We will honour relationships. This includes our existing collective bargaining agreements with unions and relationships with our staff. It is also a recognition that relationships are essential, essential for city building and community success. So all those relationships we have with everyone in the city, including of course our, the, the people. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily mean that we'll have status quo in all these relationships. It just means we'll honour them as we work through these issues. We're going to demonstrate ongoing commitment to reconciliation with the Indigenous community as well as anti-racism and community safety and well-being in the broader community. And I just felt that was important to identify as a key principle given that it was your first uh, council motion uh, on anti-racism and I know how important those three uh, pieces are to all of you so we'll, we'll always consider anything we do through that lens as well. And as, as all things, we'll, we'll be guided by our city plan and we'll work in alignment with our cultural commitments and we rely on our colleagues to demonstrate the leadership competencies that we also adhere to. And finally, continuous improvement. We will always uh, look at things from a mindset, from an open mindset or a growth mindset and one uh, thinking that we can always do better uh, on things that are, that are going on. Now, in different contexts, priorities have been identified in a number of different ways. In Connect Edmonton and the City Plan, we focus on climate resilience, urban places, healthy street and regional prosperity. They are noted at the top of this slide. Anchored in the strategic planning framework are coming uh, and coming out of previous council planning, the six council priorities are noted in blue, which are climate action and energy transition, district planning, mobility networks, community safety and well-being, arts and culture and of course economic growth. And then during priority-based budgeting exercises, participants identified the strategic attributes of programs which are essential for the community. Climate action and protection, integrated and connected communities, safe and reliable infrastructure, social well-being, and community safety and economic resilience and growth. And then your direction during the planning session was that while we were advancing an excellent and equitable quality of life for all Edmontonians through those priorities, we should also continue to keep an eye on three things. First, day-to-day -day service delivery, the experience Edmontonians receive, sound fiscal management, and safe and respectful employee experience. And of course, the OP12 motion confirmed your direction that climate action, public transit, and housing are certainly current priorities. So there's a lot of work uh, that has been done through here, and generally, while priorities have been identified in different ways and different processes, there's a lot of good nesting and consistency between those lists. So where elements are repeated, we can easily confirm priorities and I expect that for others we will need to have occasionally conversations on this just to confirm. For now, we are gathering insights and taking through uh, questions. We will uh, keep coming back for additional discussion and direction 
and our shared understanding of priorities will be critical to the conversation about what constitutes core services and what we transition the $240 million to. But I feel we've got some good clarity in, uh, from our governors in terms of what that means. Now, the motion directing this work required administration to identify $240 million that council can transi transition to its directed uh, priority areas of housing, climate change, public transport, and transit, sorry, and core services. So to be clear, I've instructed administration that the $60 million in efficiencies is to be found across all of our service areas. And in the, ins the spirit of continuous improvement, we are expecting to find ways to do better and achieve that 60 million. Determining core services is a key component of the work supporting your discussions about reallocation. An important point before we start, Defining core and not core is absolutely not the same as defining important and not important. It is simply a mechanism for structuring how we will do the review and determining where to focus priority investments. And I wanna be very respectful to staff in these conversations because I'm concerned that this exercise will cause some anxiety. Every service we provide is valued by the person who receives it and by the team that delivers it. So as we go through the process of defining core services, I encourage those following the process to remember one thing. There will be many discussions about our options, especially in this open and transparent, uh, transparent forum, and only some of those discussions will result in decisions. So let's focus on bringing our best selves to do the work we are hired to do and allow the process to unfold. And whatever comes, actions will be implemented in accordance with the principles I've described earlier and with the compassion that any change requires in a corporation like the city. And with that, I will outline the process that we would propose for defining core services. There is no universal definition of core services and often what is considered a core service changes over time and is often dependent on community and political preferences. As I said last month, core is in the eye of the beholder sometimes and we propose asking three questions to identify these core services. The first is, is a program or services required by legislation? These are the programs or services that council has no choice but to provide. There are a number of pieces of legislation the ultimately, that ultimately compelled municipalities to perform certain services, and some examples include the Municipal Government Act, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the Emergency Management Act, and the Local Authorities Election Act. Municipalities are required by legislation to do things like hold elections, plan, uh, plan land use, and provide protective services like police. If something is legally required, there's a little value in discussing not doing it, we may choose to advocate for a law change or deliver a service at a different service level, but those can be separate discussions. The next question we ask is, if the is the program practically necessary? Services that are practically necessary make sense to deliver at a municipal level, even though they are not legally required. Determining if something is practically necessary involves judgment and will ultimately require council input. Different municipalities will have different definitions of what is practically necessary and therefore may make different decisions about what is a core service. And we've identified a number of components that we can use. This can include services that are both universally available to residents and those provided on a discretionary basis for residents to use if they choose to. Services that are universally available to all citizens include things like snow clearing and fire rescue services. Those that are available on a discretionary basis include things like recreation centers. A related element is whether residents rely on the municipality for their service. For example, re residents rely on the city for snow removal on roads and active pathways. A further element is the overall demand for the service, both internal and external. Certain services serve a large portion of the population, such as parks and open spaces, and they have a broad community benefit. Other public services, very important public services, support a portion of the population, and I would use DATS as an example. There is also an organizational demand for many of our internal facing services. For example, recruiting staff might not be legally required, but if we are to function as an organization, we need to do that work to hire the right staff. Programs that support the employee experience have practical value to our staff, and of course the organization, and of course the, the community that we serve. Other services may bring an indirect benefit, for example, for Edmontonians to, part, to participate in programs they need to uh, know about them and which reflects the expectation that communications needs to happen. There is both an organizational and a community benefit to this service. 
Clearly, there are many components, and we do not expect that programs would need to meet all these criteria to be con considered practically necessary. The third and final category is whether the service is identified by Council as a priority. There are services that Council has identified as core to the work of this community. As I outlined earlier in the budget planning sessions in the City Plan and elsewhere, Council has uh, set very clear expectations in defining those priorities. Community safety and well-being and encouraging downtown vibrancy are two examples. They are particularly uh, a big focus of ours at this point. And I'll run through what our services are and give some examples of how the discussion might go for each one. But one of the key questions it, uh, to put for your consideration is, uh, what gets us to core? Is it a yes on, those, on all three? Is it a yes on one of those questions? Um, and it's a question we're asking ourselves. And I think probably the answer is kind of depends on which core service and how we feel about that. And that's, that's fine and we can do that for sure. Now this next slide has a lot of detail and the legible version is in an attachment to the council report, a public attachment. And while it's hard to read on this slide, um, it, it makes an important point. According to the city service list and our business planning approach, the city has nine key public facing programs and services. And breaking it down further, there are 35 types of service and, and within those, there are 72 subservices. Each of the nine colored rectangles uh, here show the key area service and subservice. And the detailed list is attached in the report. At the broad level, we would likely all agree that the city has a role to play in all nine general areas of work. We can see a role for the city in social support or economic development, for example. So we need to dig deeper and at the level of the services, we would likely find that some are core and some are not. So this is driving us to look at our work at the subservice level. We will need to dig into the details and if we are to have a productive conversation about what is core and what is not core. The same pattern holds true on this next slide for the seven internal facing services. They are listed on the screen as are the 35 services and 79 subservices. And again, we would likely see a role in the city in the broad categories of services like people, relationships and partnerships or environmental stewardship or positive employee experience. And as with external services, we will, re we will need to review at the subsurface level. Even then at the subsurface level, there can be some elements of the service that are core and other elements that are not. And I just wanna walk through a very specific example uh, that is very uh, internal facing, which is records management. Um, and we, that is a core service, I can tell you right now, because we have something like 21 pieces of legislation that require us to hold records. So that's clearly uh, a simple example, but one is very, that, that's super clear. Now, under movement of people and goods, what I wanna do now is go through three different examples of how we might use these questions to define whether something is core or not. So, under movement of people and goods, under road services, the subservice of snow and ice control is there. And this is our first example. So the question is, is the service required under legislation? While there is no specific legislation that directs, um, directly requires snow and ice control to be delivered, the Municipal Government Act does require that the city keep roads in a reasonable state of repair. So we would say, yes, it is required. Is the service practically necessary? Yes, Edmontonians need streets to be cleared for the safe and effective movement of people and goods. The ability to move around their city is necessary for Edmontonians in their daily life, whether it's commuting to work, getting their groceries, going to school or accessing services. When we go through the PBEB indicators, yes, it is universal and yes, people rely on the city to deliver the service. Yes, it brings a community benefit. The next is, does the service align with council priorities? Well, in our district planning, accessible transportation choices right across the mobility network, not just roads, and uh, economic growth requires the ability to move both people and goods. It supports integrated and connected communities and it enables public transit. So we would answer that question with yes as well. So snow and ice control aligns with council priorities. And because it is a yes on all three elements, the subservice clearly falls into the category of a core service. The next example is recreation and culture as a key public area of service. Within uh, that is a subservice recreation and support centers. So the first question is, is it legally required? No, it is not. There's no legislation that requires it. Is it practically necessary? This is an area that will require a more granular view. 
looking at the elements we listed in determining whether service is practically necessary, we would look at a number of things. Is the service universal or discretionary? Recreation and sports centers are available to all residents, but whether they choose to use them is indeed discretionary. Residents may play a place a greater reliance on some city recreational services over others. For example, pools and arenas are provided by other organizations. These are often provided by other not-for-profit not or public sector organizations such as YMCA or post-secondary institutions. There are very few privately run pools and arenas and those that exist may not be universally available. There is less reliance on a municipality to perform other recreation and sporting services like fitness centers or golf where, they can be, where there can be many more options available to residents. And this leads me to the next category which is demand. Where demand for a service is high and reliance for a service is high, it may be more likely to include, conclude that a service is practically necessary. Take for example pools and note that everything, every, identifying a service as core doesn't preclude council or administration from considering appropriate service levels to operate. We also look to community and organizational benefit and you can see how different subservices within an area can result in different classifications as core service. Since there are private not-for-profit gym facilities and studios in the city, as well as school and post-secondary facilities that residents can access, it indicates that gym facilities would, under this criteria, potentially be considered non-core. As for pools and arenas, the YMCAs and private clubs have indoor pools, and there are a few arena skating surfaces not run by the city. How these are limited, so there is a heavier reliance on the city to provide these facilities to meet the needs of Edmontonians, thus would likely be considered, in our view, a core service under this definition. And finally, do they align with council priorities? I think the, the answer here is yes. Community safety and well-being includes healthy living, as well as uh, including access and having access to recreation, although not necessarily city-provided recreation. This is an example of a program where a classification of the service is somewhat more complex. And I, would, I do want to pause at this point and just add a note to any staff who may be involved in recreation program, programming who might be listening to this conversation. I know that discussions like these are, are challenging and to be clear, this is a discussion, not a decision. And it is one discussion of many and when we get to the point of decisions, like I said, we'll be implementing and communicating that very clearly to staff. Now, a third example is uh, a different category uh, under civic services, which includes census service. So the city is not legally required to conduct a census. In recent years, the city has conducted a census to make sure we had current accurate information about the city's growing population. So the next question is, is it practically necessary? Well, the federal government conducts a national census, so residents do not rely on the city for this work. Is therefore, is there a demand for the service? Arguably the demand was from us, not so much from the public. And there was an organizational benefit in having the information to advocate for funding, but there's arguably not a community benefit until that advocacy brings direct results. I think it's reasonable to say therefore that no, a census is not practically necessary given that there is a federal opportunity. And no, it does not uh, directly align with any of the council priorities in our analysis. So if the census was not considered a core program, what does that mean? It doesn't mean we automatically stop doing it, instead we start asking more questions. And this brings us to the key kind of questions that we want to ask whether we are on the track of identifying something as core or not core. So whether a service is considered core or not, there are still some fundamental questions we need to ask. Are there efficiencies within the service? So it could be absolutely core, but there could be more efficient ways of doing it. Are the services being delivered at the desired standard or level? In some cases, we may be delivering a service to a higher standard than what is required. And can the delivery model be changed or be more cost effective? And are there revenue opportunities within this service? If a service is considered non-core, then we also need to ask if this service, is this, is this a service the city should continue to deliver? From operations to revenue to policy to service levels, there may be adjustments we can make that will increase efficiencies, reduce the need for city resourcing, bring about more transformative change, or otherwise create the opportunity to reallocate towards priority work that council has identified. We will continue to ensure that there is a careful consideration of these questions 
and will return to Council for direction before making any decisions. Given the large number of subservices, we will work through the list and the questions thoughtfully. And with this approach in mind and the additional direction you provide today, we propose to bring in that process of identifying core services based on the definition and the three examples I've provided for you today. The second area where we're looking for direction today is the scope of the review, namely which organizations are expected to contribute directly to the 240 million and whether you're opening the door for additional discussions in the future. As we discussed last month, the motion applies to city administration. The parts of the organization which directly report to the city manager and for which the uh, executive leadership team is accountable. Council is involved in governance and sets overall funding levels, is involved in service, policy and programming decisions. An attachment to the report we are discussing lists those entities and their relationships in much greater detail. Today I'm asking for you to determine how to approach areas where city funding, often significant funding, is allocated. We, too, we see two areas for discussion. First, Council has a direct funding relationship with some organizations in the city but not involved in making allocation policy or service decisions. Council's own advisory committees, the Edmonton Public Library, independent tribunals, the Office of the City Auditor, and the Edmonton Police Commission would be examples of those. The budgets for these groups were just approved in December, even so Council could take a number of possible actions. For example, Council could write to different groups inviting them to undertake a similar review or to use the results of the review to offset any future budget requests. Or Council could advise that their, that their funding for 2024 and onwards is being reviewed in light of the City's reprioritization efforts. Or Council could advise these groups that funding has been adjusted for, for this or future years. Or a Council could consider adjustments to their funding during the next four-year cycles as, we, uh, as a way of focusing future City services on priority areas. So lots of options and the question whether you wish to, is do we want to act on those. And I'll say right at, the, right at this point, I don't think today is the time to, to act on those, but, but something I'd like you to think about. The third category uh, are agencies that do not have a direct funding relationship with Council. For example, the City is a shareholder of EPCOR, the City provides funding to and may partly own corporations like the River Valley Alliance or the Industrial Heartland Association, but it's a budget decisions are made by the, by the board really that runs those organizations. And the city provides funding to the Independent Arts Council and Screen Industries Office Society, but does not direct the details of their work. The size of the adjustments within his administration depend entirely on whether other areas of city funding are in or out of scope. And so I think we can uh, talk about this over the coming months. Uh, and I think at this point, uh, I would advise that we should, for the moment, just lead by example, uh, do the work we're doing, and once we more, once we have that more clearly defined, we can uh, consider this uh, in another uh, future meeting. Now we'll be taking a policy review, and I'll walk you through general the general approach, and invite your uh, early input on this as well. The city has 123 council pol policies, and they are in the attachment to the report. These policies relate to accessibility, affordability, housing, and art, all the way through the alphabet to ward boundaries, wireless towers, and winter road maintenance. We're gonna go through them all, and first to note their characteristics and their purpose. And as a next step, administration will identify the type of impact a policy has on the organization. For example, the public art policy has a direct impact on budgets because it requires the city to fund a public art reserve with at least 1% of eligible capital projects. The community league grants policy requires community leagues to community notifications and uh, file for incorporation. And some po policies may affect our work with other levels of government. For example, the immigration and settlement policy outlines our commitment to attracting and retraining immigrants, refugees and their families, and that may affect our advocacy around federal or provincial programs. The green building policy outlines our support for a green building sector while the cleanup of dangerous goods policy reflects our approach to that work. Where a policy has a budget impact, we will go further uh, and consider more. Does it increase city operational or administrative expenditures? Does it drive the cost of the goods or services we purchase? Does it prevent reduction in some way? Does it reduce our revenue? And how does that work uh, equate or compare to the council pri priorities? There may be a policy, a solid policy rationale for having those impacts and the goal is to make sure that is the case. And so we'll revisit all of that with an open mind. 
Today, I would invite you, uh, you to provide any feedback on this proposed approach and identify any considerations we may have missed and any policy areas which are of particular interest to you. In March, I'll return with timelines, uh, sorry, not necessarily March, but at the next update, I'll return with timelines for the individual policy reviews and we'll be involving business areas in those reviews so there'll be a number of different timelines and ways to provide your input. Now last month I outlined the seven streams of work for this OP12 project. The first streams of work are well underway within administration and I am seeking some direction on streams four and five today or at least some discussion. Stream six was initially to solicit council generated ideas and we have gone beyond that and invited ideas from councillors, from the civic unions and from the city employees. And we've received so far more than 100 submissions from all three of those groups. And we're analyzing them uh, as we speak. Stream seven has been implemented since our last meeting. Administration has introduced a hiring restraint program that took effect on January 27th. This program includes a new process to support leaders in determining whether a vacant position should or could be filled. When the hiring restraint program was announced, we had 470 active recruitment requisitions being used to fill more than 600 positions in the organization. These, opens included tempor these openings included temporary positions like golf course and green shack workers and lifeguards for the coming summer, as well as permanent roles such as peace officers, engineers, mechanics, and clerks. And we are reviewing every open recruitment. Of those, of those 100 re 30 recruitments were quickly continued. We had just made offers and it was important to stand by them and we felt that those should con continue on notwithstanding the work we're doing on OP12. Next, 250 positions were reviewed and were deemed legally required, practically necessary and tied to a council priority and those, so those recruitments are going ahead as well. A further 220 positions are pending a decision and will not proceed to recruitment at this time until we've done the full analysis of those positions and that is actively on the go right now. In addition to this, travel, hosting and consultant spending is being limited. New processes have been introduced and only mission critical expenditures are proceeding. And I want to make it clear that we're not freezing travel, but we are making some very thoughtful decisions. And as an example, uh, there, are, there are things that we used to send five or six people to because it was a good opportunity. Now we're perhaps sending one or two uh, people to. And, and when I think about some of the important travel that has to happen, uh, not just in administration, but with councillors to things like FCMs, uh, important engagements that, that uh, uh, in Ottawa, for example, that reap great rewards for the city in terms of funding allocations where we see those travels as mission essential for sure. So there's a lot of work underway and I'm pleased with the progress we are making so far. Uh, looking ahead for the next update, we'll have additional insights from the policy review and the work on defining core services. Uh, we're going to have a lot more insights on ana analyzing the, uh, the ideas we're getting from councillors, from staff, from the unions, and of course we internally. And we will be able to make a report, I believe, on some of the initial savings. And we may all also wish to have a conversation about some of the early ideas on revenue generation. I would say though that we're at a point now where we need to do a lot of work. We need to dig into a lot of details, especially if you support the, uh, the definition of core services and the questions we ask to get to those core, core services. So, um, you know, given that we also have a recess week at the end of the March, uh, I would propose that maybe uh, doing a fulsome update at, M uh, at the end of April would be the best next opportunity. Um, notwithstanding the need for monthly updates, I just think, uh, we, we probably need about six weeks to dig into the next stage of this uh, ourselves at this point. So now uh, we're, we're happy to start the conversation. I'm, I'm really looking for some specific direction on the question of core services, legally required, practically necessary and a priority and to what extent do programs need to be a yes for them to be considered. And if, if it's the answer is depends on that, I, I'm comfortable with that. I, I really do think it depends on the service. I'm also looking for clarity that at least for the moment, uh, we, we keep the scope limited to city administration. And just looking for some preliminary thoughts you might have on the policy review. And with that, uh, welcome any questions you might have and, and the dialogue. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you so much, Andre. And uh, you know, really, really appreciate the uh, kind of thoughtful approach that you have taken to this and also keeping uh, uh, the, the city staff informed 
uh, as, you, as you progress on this work. We need to make sure that we are doing it in, in a way that we are not causing unnecessary anxiety among, uh, among the, uh, the, the, the folks who give their best to, uh, to make our city a great place, right? So, uh, yeah, no, thank you for taking that, that approach. Um, uh, now, questions to administration, and I'll see the list here. I don't see the list yet. The, the presentation is still on the screen. Here yeah, we we're go. We're just changing. Here we go. All right, this was exempted by Councillor Tang. So, Councillor Tang, you want to go first, or you, I can just follow the list? Uh, sure. Um, I can, happy to start. <clears throat> um, yeah, very much appreciate uh, this presentation. I think it's interesting because uh, core. Core service as defined by, you know, by the legislation, I think has been certainly came up uh, in this chamber and many Edmontonians urging us. But if we actually did that, if we go by that strict definition, the city wouldn't be offering half the things that we're doing. Um, so I, I I actually really appreciate the very thoughtful approach and the questions that you're asking. Um, I, you know, one, one of the things that, that um, I, I, I don't have a ton of questions, but one thing I, I, I wanted to raise, you know, I was looking ahead at next week's committee um, meeting, and there was one report uh, around the, the alcohol in the park it was a, with a very in-depth GBA plus analysis. And I have to say, I was actually quite happy to see that depth. Um, but I'm very conscious that's you know, external consultant, that's uh, public engagement, that's, that's much more resource. It elevated the level in my opinion, of the conversation, but it comes at a cost too. Um, and and I know we've had this conversation about consultant fees, and I, I saw that in the presentation as well. Um, and I guess specifically on the public engagement side, you know, there's such a public facing element to it. You know, if we want to be kind of ele elevating kind of that level, you know, what, what can happen internally um, I guess to to take some of the pressure off of the consultants, uh, and um, it, you know, I, I guess I'm just wondering kind of what's what's the specific thinking there. Um, I was actually quite impressed with it, and I was thinking, wow, it would be amazing if all city reports had this level of analysis, but not possible. I get that, um, uh, but but at the same time, then what is possible within OP12 to 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 raise that standard? I suppose. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Tang. That, that's certainly a, a specific direction we have. So we actually had our first uh, discussion on consultancy services in one department uh, yesterday. We're going to sort of tackle it uh, department by department and ask the question. But we had this very same discussion yesterday with the team. Uh, you know, th there's some things that we can absolutely do in house, uh, but but there is a tension between the level of public engagement that, that we're asking for and we're challenging ourselves to do and the cost uh, of doing that. Even if it's done in, in house, there's, there's a cost to it as well. So I think the reality is um, that that's something we're gonna have to tackle with. Uh, I, I think what I'll be able to bring back to council as a first step is good clarity on what we are consulting on and what we're not consulting on and why and what is the pro and con of, of doing that. We've got lots of good examples. Um, I can tell you, you know, we, we chatted about a couple of examples yesterday where um, there was a thought a year ago whether or not we should use consultants to develop the community well-being and, and uh, community safety and well-being strategy. And we decided not to use consultants. We created a bit of a task team in-house. In and I think they did a fantastic job of putting that draft strategy together. And I think it was excellent. And I think uh, we had lots of engagement with, with community. And we're going to keep doing that and que keep tweaking it. But I think that's a good example where we chose not to use a consultant. But what, what you will see, I think, first uh, from a council perspective is a summary of all the consultants, what it's, what it's achieving, and an analysis on is it getting the outcomes we want. I think what we have to do is uh, come up with a me mechanism that just uh, analyzes what we're looking for and then I think we're always going to have cases where it makes sense to spend that money and somewhere it says no but let's do it in-house. So, But we'll be able to bring you through uh, some of, uh, analysis of that in the coming months. That's great um, and would you also even get into some of that you know cost cost benefit analysis you know if we were to do this in house this will be this much more but you this these are the outcomes you'll get back or is that 
too granular. No, I think that we're, that's definitely part of that piece. There, okay. There's a lot of things that we know would be more expensive uh, uh, if we did in-house, particularly on the integrated uh, construction and, and infrastructure, because you're, right. you're, you're creating an expertise you don't necessarily need all the time. So, you know, there's some very unique uh, infrastructure projects like the Walter Dale Bridge. You know, we don't need that level of expertise in the city all the time. It's much more cost effective if you bring it in for that specific project. But we will be able to demonstrate that clearly from a business case perspective. Yeah. And then just, uh, you know, lastly, uh, can you just like specify the timeline again for your next update? Because this is a fairly significant body of work. Is one month kind of enough for you to come back with and yeah if you can just talk about that a bit yeah i i mean i do appreciate the monthly uh schedules but in this case given we have a recess at the end of march my recommendation is that we do the next update at the end of april because i know um i've got some really good clarity now but i know the next couple of months we've got some hard work to do and, and digging into things especially to analyze all the ideas and then yeah. we'll see where we are at the end of april great thank you yeah, i think i think that's a good idea instead of coming back in march maybe end of April, early May, right? That give you a couple of months to uh, dig deeper into all this. And also input that you're gonna to get today from council members will allow you to reflect on that too, right? So yeah. maybe and, if, and I, I, if council is okay with that approach, I think uh, we'll be fine to come back in uh, in uh, April or early May. Yep. Thank you. Good, all right. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. I... Oh, just hold on, Councillor Stevenson. Before you go, before I, I'll start your time all over again. Uh, I want to welcome uh, students from uh, Bassett School, Grade 6 class. They are here with their teacher, Mrs. Uh, Knasowicz, right? And uh, their ward representative is Councillor Wright from uh, Ward Spamitapi. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Nice to see you. Are you uh, uh, staying here for uh, for the whole day or just for the morning? You're doing the mock council. What are your uh, topic of discussion? Who's your mayor for the day? Mayor Iman. Councillor Akam. So, Councillor Akam, can you come down here to the mic and tell us what you're going to be talking about? So, what are your topic topic of discussion today? My topic of my topic of discussion is um, se separate smoking rooms because when it's outside of buildings um so younger society and older society are inhaling second hand smoke which is not safe for them yeah so that's why um my motion was to create um ventilated s smoking rooms outside of buildings so then other others don't inhale secondhand smoke oh that's that's pretty that's interesting area cool i know some airports have that kind of areas right uh, yeah cool all right, but they're still connected to the buildings, right? So, cool. Well, let us know what the result will be, okay? And I hope that you will have a very, very healthy and uh, 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 rigorous debate from both sides of the uh, uh, the the arguments. Yeah, cool. All right. Okay, nice to see you. you. Cool. You. All right. Take care. All right. Have fun. All right, now can you please start uh, Councillor Stevenson's time again, please? Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, really appreciate this uh, uh, really systemic approach. It's, it's great to see and really clearly laid out. So I have some thoughts and ideas, but really just to, to build on what I think is a, is a great process laid out. Um, you know, with, with the services and subservices, uh, wondering if it would be challenging, cause just trying to think how we kind of map it onto our general understanding. And I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to also talk about programs 
um, sort of by some of their, I'm thinking root, root for Trees, um, the Infill Liaison Team Recover, just sort of those, those programs that I think we identify a bit more clearly. There were some that I didn't know how to map on to where, you know, where they were in the subservices. Yeah, I, I think the answer is absolutely, Councillor. We can we can look at those programs. I I, th I think they're and and probably into different categories. Some that are really straightforward and we don't need to tinker with, especially some that have been recently adjusted, totally. uh, and others that we can look at for sure. Great. Just wondering too. You know, I really appreciated sort of the stream three. Those those core questions being asked. Also wondering if we could add in a question around. You know, can the service be modified to better meet strategic outcomes? So I was thinking of your example with the rec centers and, you know, gym facilities and recognizing that there, for many Edmontonians, there are, are private options. But maybe thinking about, you know, um, are there people who face barriers to accessing other gym facilities and the state could refocus our attention on that? Yeah, I think it's a good question to ask. Great. Also just wondering, and this is, this is a complicated one, so, uh, you know, not needing a, a clear answer or a specific answer, but just wondering, again, we're looking at services, subservices, wondering how we're thinking about sort of those intersectional issues like climate change, for example, and, and just making sure that we don't, don't lose, and I guess maybe that comes in the next phase in terms of the strategic outcomes, but just, just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's the right answer. I think we, we address those. Uh, and how we're doing them across the whole corporation as we do sort of part two, which is how do we reinforce the council priorities? And as part of that, I think we absolutely need to uh, sort of cross level across all the different aspects that we're doing and make sure we're doing it in every part of the work we do. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, for, so looking sort of to the confirming scope, I really agree with your, your recommendation around stream five that for now we can lead by example and then and I think later in the budget cycle, get get those external groups sort of prepped for again, a, maybe a similar exercise, but again for the next four year budget cycle. Just wondering if there's, I think there's a, I would maybe ask for some clarification around how groups like the Arts Council, Screen Industries were categorized, just because I think we have a fairly direct budgetary relationship there in terms of setting the budget. Um, so maybe just again, not to be dealt with right now, but I think just something we consider as we as we move forward. Yeah, and I, I think it's just um, the one of the reasons we wanted to put that attachment in. It, it's all very different um, in terms of the governance models, and so you absolutely have uh, direct funding applications, but you've also uh, appointed and delegated sort of decisions to boards and to administration. So I think you just have to, as long as you're um, live to those different relationships, and for example, the regional relationships, you know, on, on those those where we're part owners of, um, we're, you know, in some cases, one, thir one thirteenth owners of things. And so we can't yeah. be directing things without having collab, you know, discussions with the other partners. So I, I think the point is, as long as we're live to that, what we've delegated, uh, then, then, uh, beyond that, we can certain, certainly provide that governance advice. As, yeah. But is the, the key is we have to know what hat we're wearing. Are we shareholder? Are we board? Absolutely. Are we, you know, yeah. and once we're clear on that, then I think that sort of points the way. Absolutely, yep. And I, and I think these are, these are the finer details and again, something to be considered in the next stream. I'm going to try to get through in one round. Um, two, two other things in the scope. Uh, maybe just looking at grant programs, which are undersubscribed, which are oversubscribed, just again to look at the ability to optimize those. Also just wondering when a consideration of some of the revenue options through uh, fees and fines, like would fines be considered in our policies or our bylaws? Actually? Yeah, so we'll look, those are all on the list for consideration. Great. And then a final one, uh, just the idea, I really, again, appreciate that there's the internal portal for a city staff to highlight um, areas for, for potentially red tape reduction. Just wondering if we could do that externally as well uh, for Edmontonians to highlight process barriers or services that, that create those challenges just to show that, that external commitment to red tape reduction as well and maybe identify some opportunities. I'm pretty sure we have a system, but I'll, I'll check on that and confirm. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Wright. Thank you. I just, um, Councillor Stevenson, I think, sort of asked or made the note of it about um, uh, rec facilities and that. I, I'm just kind of concerned about the subjectivity of the word practical. Um, 
Be, because in, in your, on your slide, I mean, it does say that Edmontonians rely heavily on the rec centers, but yet on the other side of it, it, it says that um, private business, I guess, do you have a definition for, for practically ne necessary or are we, are we looking at serving the majority of Edmontonians or um, I guess niche sort of? Yeah, and I, I think this is the trick with this one, Councillor right? because it is in the eye of the beholder and it is subjective. And so what, what I've tried to uh, illustrate through the examples is the kinds of questions we, we would ask ourselves. Um, uh, at the end, I think it'll be, um, you know, consider, we'll make some recommendations, but they're all a little different. So um, we've tried to break it down in terms of, is it universe? So the definition, to answer your definition question, it really gets to that slide where, uh, as part of the practically necessary, we're asking, is it universal or discretionary? Is it reliance uh, on the municipality? Is there a reliance on the service? Is there a demand for the service? Is there a population served? What is the population served? And then finally, community or organizational benefit. So I think the definition you're looking for is, is answered by answering those five other questions. But it's still, at the end of the day, going to be subjective even when we answer those five questions. And it'll also be in the eye of the beholder whether they agree with that, I would say. That's the tricky part. Yeah. Okay, and then, but that, sort of that analysis then will be coming back to council to sort of validate? Correct, for, okay. e for each of the subservices. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice. Uh, great, great presentation. And a thank you to our city manager, uh, Mr. Kobo, and also to your team who worked on this. Uh, my first question, and I'm sorry if I missed it here, I tried to find, and because regularly and then uh, we all know and the city had 73 nines of business, so with the change and with the budget uh, last year and how many uh, nines of business right now we have, is it, I, I heard you mention 72 sub services and seven facing services and 35 services. and So in total, the nine of business. So is it like still 73 or change it to 77 or 79? Um, I still think it's 73 services, but okay. then we've broken it down into the further sub-services. But I'll just check with, is that correct? I, th I think we're closer Stacey? to 70 services on the placement. Yeah. Um, but what we're trying to convey is there is there's 70 whether it's 70 or 73 there's there's lines of services that we look at when we compare what the city does against the municipal reference model but the, to do this analysis we then go deeper to the subservice level within each of those services what are the subservices provided and then when we apply these definitions there might be times we go even deeper so we're trying to take a layered approach to the application of the definitions. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, so I I do like the this three stream questions how we define the core business, core services. Just the one pieces one piece I would like to make sure that included or not. Uh, for example, repeating services or overlap services between the municipal government and the different level of government. So how we include, reflect that piece when we ask to define to call services. Yeah, it's uh, certainly part, I, I think I talked about this in the first presentation a month ago where we, we were gonna do, we are gonna do some detailed analysis on, um, it may be a service we're providing, but is it in our jurisdictional, should we be doing it? So we are doing things right now that are that other jurisdictions should be doing, and, and we're going to have that analysis for, for council. Uh, so yes, I understand the analysis will be done there, and then it's just for the, if we look at the specific criteria or question we're asking, and the, uh, I think I think uh, it's reasonable to ask that question, and then when we define the call. Correct. Services. Yeah. Okay. Um, another one I would like to ask frontline working uh, or services compared to the in house support services and is not type of um, separation and is uh, one of 
is under one of those questions or not. Yeah, and that's why in the presentation and in the attachment, you'll see um, we've we've classified subservice subservices under serving Edmontonians, which would be the more public facing. And then we're going to go through all the subservices that are internal that are based on managing the corporation. So, and I, you know, the example is records management. That is very much a part of managing the corporation and an internal service, but it is absolutely core because of the legislation that requires us to hold records. So. Yeah, I know we look at this from different dimension and then different group and a different category. Uh, I just want to to remind this front line uh, working or front line services and how we uh, ask certain questions and to look at in-house support services. So thank you for that. Um, another piece, can you uh, describe a little bit more about the direct funding relationship? So what is specific scope? What is specific authorities and then for the council when we have this direct funding relation or when we don't have, what does that specific mean? Uh, it, it, it just means what kind of uh, decisions that you're essentially entitled to make depend on uh, the structure of the organization, who owns it, and do you have all the power to make the decision, or is that shared power, or have you delegated the power? And it's different for every one of those corporations uh, and entities. So um, that's what it's really about, though. It's about what is your role as a counselor with each of those entities, and it's never the same. It's always different depending on how those have been put together. Uh, I think I still have one follow-up question. I will come back. Yeah, no oh, worries. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Jans. Thank you. So I was wondering if the mayor, city manager, has heard from any of our ABCs. Have any of them voluntarily come forward and uh, suggested that they would also participate in some sort of exercise in solidarity? Uh, I don't think specifically, <clears throat> Councillor Jantz, but I do know some of those organizations have in the past already done this and have done this as part of budget pressures. And I would say the one that has been, that really stands out in my mind is EPL has been really excellent partners with us, especially through COVID, on doing these kinds of exercises. So, um, yes. Like EPL saw a $2 million reduction, I think, in 21 or 20. Um, yeah. Um, I. How about, can I ask the police commissioners if they've raised this at the commission? Uh, probably not be the this venue to ask that question because uh, there's no official representatives of the police commission here, right? I don't, think okay. it'll be, I don't think it'll be fair to ask individual commission members that question, right? I think uh, uh, maybe once maybe in the future when commission is in front of us, maybe we can ask that question at that time. Or maybe a direction from council in, once we have, once we reach that point. Right, yeah. okay, that's fair. The only other comment I'd make, uh, Mayor, which I did a month ago as well, is you know, from an operational perspective, we, we strongly believe that um, we're on a road now with the police funding formula that will come back to council to present. And we think that's the mechanism for looking at that part, at least for the operational side. Right. Um, with regards to consultants, does that include all sort of external expenditures, including like legal costs and like is it is it a whole bundle of things? I'm thinking of things yes. that could be in house or ex house. Yes. Communications. Yeah. All of the above. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not gravel because we just went through that conversation. Okay. Um, questions about the uh, management structure. Is that going to be contemplated as well too? And yeah, as I I, I, I kind of went through that, we're doing the work on that, but I explained the work we were going to do at the last update in January, uh, and it is under stream three, two. two, stream two, which is the organizational review, and particularly uh, with regard to man not just management but all supervisors. Um, there is uh, a work going on where we've identified, uh, I'll refer to them as anomalies, where maybe you've got one person working for another person, that kind of thing. So that's been identified as part of a, a multivariate analysis work that's been done. And now what deputy city managers and their teams are doing are going through each one of those anomalies, reviewing it, 
uh, understanding why it is the way it is, and they'll report back to me on that, and that's how we're sort of looking at things like scale and, and depth in terms of have we got it right or wrong. So right. that um, is happening now. Yeah. That's helpful. Um, I was asked about our council's commitment to this, whether um, if, say, the province put the photo, took off the photo radar moratorium, brought it back, we saw the 20 million funding restored. If the province decided to pay their taxes on their buildings downtown, we saw, I think, the 14 million restored. Would council still be committed to this? And I said, we passed the motion. I imagine we would be, but is, how is administration contemplating if we're seeing variances or favorable, I'll call it that, favorable in, in income in, is it still, we're looking to find 15 million no matter what, we're not looking at the revenue line, we're looking at still the rethink of the expenditure line, because that's... Yeah, so uh, I think we have to remember that the, the 60 million has already been taken away. Yeah. So we are committed down that road because you took it out of the budget. I just got to stay within budget. So if I stay within budget next year, then I've achieved the 60 million, which I will. Got it. So that's that stream. On the 240 stream about what we transition to, I, I think if we get more revenue, it gives us more opportunity to do more transitions, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, revenue generation or, or ways to raise revenue is part of the $240 million as part of the motion to thank you. Absolutely, yeah. and we specifically are looking into uh, what is the best way of using those funds yeah. to get the most uh, partnership from other orders of government. That was yeah. a specific task as yeah. well. Got it. Good. Councillor Nack, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. Um, I just wanted to, to ask a little more about, about those the direct funding relationship because my understanding is EPL is voluntarily sort of being a part of this at the moment. We haven't asked them, but I thought they were contributing. Uh, I don't believe I've had that conversation with the CEO. I, I think um, they have always contributed to these exercises, so I'm not surprised, but we, we have not sort of given them instructions at this point um, to do this. And, and I guess that leads more broadly into to all of the groups within that. And, and I, I am struggling with the notion that we wouldn't ask everyone with the direct funding relationship to be a part of this because appreciating that EPL has done, a, I think, by far and away the best job of any group within the city over the last decade around that. And I mean, I think within the city auditor, there's only ever been one funding ask increase over the last decade. And the only other one that they got was us forcing an increase on them in 2015 because they weren't taking it. Um, I, it feels like every one of our direct funding partners should be a part of this. And so I, 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 I guess for me, do you need, if, if that is the preferred direction, maybe I'm the only one on council, but, but I guess I want to ask you directly, if my desire is to see everyone involved in that, do you want that direction today, or how do you want that to be provided? Yeah, Councillor, I, I just want to be clear. I'm not saying we never do that. I'm saying not today. And quite frankly, I don't have the capacity to even ask them to do this right now because it's it takes quite a lot of energy and effort I've figured out over the last month and a half so yeah. far to, to organize these thoughts, do the analysis, get the considerations. And so... All I'm saying at this point is we, we don't, shouldn't do that now. I, I don't have, quite frankly, the time to start um, pushing that kind of direction out. What I'd like to do is get our processes underway, make sure they're working well, make sure the model and the, and the seven streams we've identified is working, learn it from it a bit, do some adjustments, and then we'll come back to council with further consideration of that. I, I would say probably end of April, uh, okay. if, if not. So June. that would so, be a decision point for us in, at the end of it. I just want to make sure there's enough time because, and again, maybe I'm the only yeah. member of council, but I want to be very clear that my expectation is that everyone that has a direct funding relationship is a part of this exercise. And so I'd like to at least be able to say yes or no. And if I'm on the losing end of that, then, then that's okay. But yeah. I just want to know there is a check-in point for that. Yeah. yeah, I believe the the check-in on that would probably be end of April, early May with council. Uh, we'll, okay. we'll know a lot more by by then, and and quite frankly, I just don't have the 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 time to, to start affecting that. Externally. Yeah, and, and my expectation would be that these groups do that work internally. I mean, I know there'd be an administrative you know, touch point with yourself, but but I think we all have to, you know, EPL's done it themselves for for years. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with asking everyone else to to take that. So okay, that's helpful. I'll, I'll await that conversation at the end of April for. 
the appropriate time. So uh, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nag. Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to follow up on, on what uh, Councillor Nack was speaking of. EPL, uh, from my understanding, is going to take on this exercise as they always have in the past. I don't want to speak for um, the CEO of EPL, but uh, it is my understanding that they will be taking on this exercise without being asked to do so. Uh, and I just wanted to share about core services. You, you'd mentioned that you would like to... Oh, and I also wanted to say, Councillor Nack, I do agree with you. I would like to us to follow up on considering asking other uh, boards and agencies to take on the same approach. Uh, and I also wanted to, you're looking for direction, my understanding, on what core service means to counsel to us. Is that correct? The, the direction counselor is, uh, you know, I, I walked you through three different examples of how we would analyze what is core or not. And I, I spe specifically chose those examples to be one very clear on core, one very clear on not core, and one a bit cloudy. Uh, and the idea was we, we kind of demonstrated how we're doing it. I guess my question is now I want to go do that with all the other services, but I wanted to check in to make sure that that process was one that council, uh, you know, liked, I guess, uh, or or do we need to add, ask different questions? Okay, yeah, no, I think that's a great approach. And I just wanted to uh, give this thought out there. Often um, people see core services as what they can see. Public safety, uh, mowing the grass, uh, snow um, maintenance, uh, road maintenance, those types of things are what people, like record keeping, as you said, is very, it's fundamental. It's, we're legislated. We, it is a definite core service, but it's not something that the population sees or realizes. But I, I do see core services from the perspective of residents being, as I said, road repair, snow removal, grass maintenance, those things. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Principe. Councillor Jans, can you take the chair, please? Take it. I just follow, want to follow up on Councillor Nack's uh, uh, questions around having our direct funding partners be involved. Absolutely important. I think they should be expected to or requested to go through this seven stream analysis. Um, before we grant further funding, right? Uh, whether it's interim funding or permanent funding, I think, yes, maybe when we come in May, council needs to give that direction to uh, to you, but I would expect, because big chunk of our money, the taxpayer's money actually goes to run those organizations. Would that be fair to kind of come in May to set that kind of direction? Oh, I think it's entirely fair and, and understanding this conversation that helps us uh, set set how that how we would do that. Uh, we can work on how we would do that over the next month or so so we can be super clear when we come back. Because one of the outcomes I see out of this review is demonstrating to Edmontonians the value for money, right? So if we cannot do that for agencies and boards that we fund, then we will not be able to prop fully do that, right? I think it's very important that they engage in that exercise. Uh, another thing I want to understand, I think you're going in that direction. I just want to confirm it to myself. The responsibilities that have been downloaded onto municipalities by the federal and provincial government, we are picking up the pieces. Uh, housing is like shelters and part of that, right? Uh, uh, animal control is another part of that. It's not that we stop doing those things, but you will give us a clear sense around how much money we are spending on those areas, and then that becomes part of our ever advocacy to the province saying, you know, or to the feds, these are your areas of responsibility. We are doing this. Property taxpayers are paying for it. We would like to shift that, and you own up those responsibilities, right? Yeah, 100%, Mayor, we're going to demonstrate okay. that. And we may even suggest we stop doing some of those things, yeah. Uh, yeah. depending on what the, the risk of not doing those things would be. Um, so we'll, we'll have, that'll be a, a, a key discussion we have with Council in the coming months. Um, we'll outline the total cost, we'll break it down as to, you know, we, are, we know we're spending money on shelters and we, have, we don't have, you know, we don't have the responsibility to do that right now. Yeah. So that'll be on the list, as will some of the other things you mentioned. Got it. Uh, on, the, on the decisions 
uh, what is core, what is not core, what is necessary, what is not necessary. I just want to understand that at what stage council can give you some sense and direction that if council is not ready to get into that area and say, well, this is for them is core, right? Or is important for say that I use recreation centers, for example, right? If council determines that it is a core service, right? Then you don't have to undertake all that huge amount of work, then come back and council will say, no, this is not what we wanted to do, right? So I think still seeking efficiency, still seeking continuous improvement. At what, sta at what point would you like to get some traction from council saying, you know, these areas are not touchable or something right now? Yeah, I think it's probably the next update or the update after that. So certainly no later than June, but that, but I want to go do some of this work. It's, it's, uh, it's important. We'll bring a list forward for okay. you for, for consideration. And of course the, the trick is once, as we, it, once council makes a decision, on what is core and what you don't want us to touch, then that starts to fall into that category. And you'll remember the pie charts from the last presentation. Mm -hmm. if, if you define more services that we, you don't want us to uh, impact on this, for this, that'll, that'll make the job more difficult yes. within yeah. the percentage. Yeah. Yeah. And what we'll do when we bring that, once we'll bring the core services back as a recommendation, council will make the decision, and then we'll give you the, what the new sort of pie chart looks like based on those decisions. Okay. If that makes sense. I, I, okay. Yeah. But I think. I th okay. That's good for. Uh, I think I've, I've got, a, got a good sense now. Which, which way we go? Because at that time, you know, if council you identify say ten million dollars, whatever, right? And council say, you know, this is not this is not the area we want to touch. Then it's our decision to say, okay, well, you know, you did your work. But Correct. This is something that we yeah. thought is not necessary. Yeah. Okay. Got it. But we will bring forward thoughtful decisions yeah. uh, on the two hundred and forty million. And, and then it's it's up to you as to what you do with those. Okay. Um, but but yeah, the, but in addition to that, it's also important that even for services that are core, we think we can find efficiencies. Oh, absolutely. And we will. And yeah. so that's where I, I yeah. think some of those efficiencies can contribute to the 60 million. Some can contribute to the 240 million, depending right. on where we are. Cool. But you know, there there are efficiencies to be found in yeah. I would say every service that we do. So yeah, absolutely. So if it, I just want to make it clear that if it's identified as core, it doesn't mean we're not going to dig into it on the other questions. That that's my understanding too. Like all the seven kind of streams, you would still kind of go through that analysis, still Correct. looking for looking for ways to do uh, things differently yeah. and better way. Okay, got it. Okay, uh, I will move the second round. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, and so. My question already answered, and from y your question, and then you don't need a second. Like, I don't need a second. Okay, so good. I try to it. find. I got it. To I'll take made. the chair back then. Yeah, yeah thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So that concludes the questions on this item. Once again, thank you so much for all the hard work. So uh, we will. Mr. Mayor. Sorry. Do we need a motion? I just told them before we go to the motion, then uh, I just want to understand council is okay that uh, the next report on this item be uh, either end of April or, or early May. Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. good. All right. Uh, Councilor Tang, go ahead, please. Sure. Um, uh, I'd like to move that the February 22nd, 2023 Office of the City Manager Report OCM 01643 be received for information. And that attachment four of uh, this report remain private, pursuant to sections 24, advice from officials, and 27, privilege information of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Okay. Second. Uh, second by Councillor Prince Bay, right? Okay, got Correct. it. Correct. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Uh, anyone wish to speak? Uh, seeing none, please vote. So, sorry, can I close? Oh, sorry, close, Councillor Tang, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I think a lot has already been said. I, I just want to reiterate again the appreciation for this work. Um, personally, I like the outcomes uh, based approach that you're taking uh, and the openness to feedback. I think there's lots of different channels and, uh, and you, you know, you're not holding back on taking in feedback, which is great. Um, I, I do want to, you know, uh, emphasize that I think staff morale is really top of mind for me. 
Um, and you know, if we're looking at outcome as high quality of service, we need a workforce that has strong morale and culture. And I know conversations like this isn't easy. And sometimes we toss around examples um, that can have tremendous impact on people. Um, so I, I, I also want to appreciate Andre your the care you're showing for the workforce well-being. Um, you know, I I know it's not shaped just by this one. Uh, OP12 amendment. I know there's lots of different factors that goes into that, but this is, I think, pretty key transformational work we're taking, um, you know, for the next while that I think that will be really relevant. Um, and so, uh, I, and then I think the third piece is, you know, I will agree with the, the, the comments made around the the agency sports and commissions, but I also think your recommendation of a phased approach is sensible uh, and sound. You know, I think piling everything on you all in one go is probably not helpful at this stage because the I think the scope of the you know the baseline work is already so big. Um, I'm I'm very mindful that the biggest ABC that that you know has a biggest financial implication is the police commission and the police service, um, and. Uh, and there, and there is a time and place for that conversation as well. Um, so I, overall, I just wanna say, you know, there's of course always room for improvement, but I certainly appreciate the way you're taking in feedback uh, from us and many, many stakeholders and employees um, and just wanna be able to, you know, support you in this work, um, you know, continue to make sure that we do have uh, that strong culture and morale in the workforce to deliver the service that Edmontonians can see and feel and it's tangible. Um, so thank you and um, uh, and very excited to see what comes back uh, uh, in April. Thank you, Councillor Tang, for those very thoughtful uh, comments and uh, I think we all agree with you on that. Yep, thank you. All right, so please vote. Yes, Tim. Thank you, Councillor Kerbo. We're just waiting for one more vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Good. So that's 7.1. Going down the list. Uh, Bylaws, right? Yeah, so I do recall the conversation from earlier this week that the natural progression would now to be moved into 9.2, which is a private conversation with the city manager. Okay. Could we jump to 9.2, please? Bring that forward. Yep. I'll move that we bring item 9.2 forward. Second. Second, Second by Council Salvador. Please vote. And jointly, second by Council Wright as well, right? Third by Council. Third. <laughs> Yes, Tim. Thank you, Councilor Kurtmel. We have all the votes, Mayor. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move that we go into private pursuant to Section 24, advice from officials of the Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act. Second. Second by Councilor Rice. All right, please vote. Yes, Tim. Thank you, Councilor. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please.
I, I, I think I love that approach. Okay. Okay, we'll give you a couple of minutes to uh, unlock the doors. We're back online, Mayor Sohi. to show other counselors also care about this issue and it's not just I would be happy to second that too. Great. Great. Yeah. Maybe. We'll see. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, we're back. Do I need to do the roll call too? Yeah, we, we, we took a break, right? So we might as well. It would be okay. good just so we know yeah. who's here to yeah. vote. Okay, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Pinspey. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Hello. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Council Salvador. Good afternoon. Council Cartmel. Councilor Rice. Here. And Councilor Jans. Here. Okay. We are. Uh, I'll go to Councilor Paquette to move the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I move that attachment one be added to the February 22nd, 2023 Office of the City Manager verbal report 0C or OCM 017352 that the actions outlined in attachment one of the February 22nd, 2023 Office of the City Manager verbal report OCM 01735 be approved. And three, that attachment one and the February 22nd, 2023 Office of the City Manager Verbal Report OCM 01735 remain private pursuant to Section 24, Advice from Officials of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Second. Second by Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. All right. Now we are on bylaw 8.1, bylaw 20364, <coughs> amendments to create a new, new offense and penalties specific to vehicle noise. This was exempted by Councillor Tang. Right. And uh, 
is there a presentation or opening remarks from administration? Or are we just going? Uh, Go ahead. Just a few opening remarks from me and apologies. We've changed our delegation a little bit this afternoon with some uh, overlapping meetings. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this issue of vehicle noise disturbing other motorists and Edmontonians in general is a, a perennial issue and um, one which is being tackled by many cities around the world. In November 2022, the Community and Public Safety or Services Committee directed administration to return to council with uh, a bylaw establishing new fine amounts for excessive vehicle noise. We have returned with a draft amendment to bylaw 5590 which adheres to the direction given and within a timeline that would allow for a public education phase prior to the summer, which tends to be a busy time for vehicle noise complaints. This bylaw change is to increase the deterrence measures available to law enforcement in Edmonton and is presented uh, for your discussion and consideration for three readings. Um, with me today to answer any questions you may have about this report and the draft bylaw, uh, is Nancy Jacobson from Legal Services. Thank you so much for your brief remarks. And now we'll go to questions to administration. Uh, Councillor Tang, you selected this. So you great. go first, go ahead, please. Great, thank you so much. Um, yes, great work on this. I really appreciate this bylaw coming forward. Uh, I was wondering, um, because the motion back then kind of had a fine amount in there, I was wondering if you can speak a little bit to whether there was analysis done in terms of, um, you know, yes, this is the amount that's really going to deter people or there's some kind of other number that might be more effective or, you know, is this fine, is this kind of amount too exorbitant that will be too easy to get challenged in the court? Uh, wondering if you can share a bit more thoughts on that. I think if I can, I would pass that uh, question off to uh, to Nancy, just with respect Me to- too. yeah. Yeah, thanks, the creation David. and court. Thanks, David. Um, so the fine amount was as directed by council, and so that's why we've come back with $1,000. But if council wants to give us direction on a different number, they certainly can. Um, there is no magic number when it comes to fines. Uh, $1,000 is a good upper limit for some procedural lim reasons. I wouldn't go above that number, and I would certainly recommend that we not create a disparity between all vehicles and motorcycles. But past that, this is a decision for you. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, and so you know, speaking of that disparity between those two types of, you know, vehicles, um, what I actually liked about this was that it brings the two in line where, pre where previously, uh, you know, one was fined higher than the other. And that's a feedback I've heard a lot from, you know, the, the motorcycle community that they were worried something like this would disproportionately target them. Um, uh, so I guess just uh, if you can, I was wondering if you can kind of expand on that disparity you know has it always been that case you know is it true that when it comes to noisy vehicles that annually tickets are issued more to motorcyclists than than modified vehicles for example so councillor there has for a very long time been a provincial offense applicable to all motor vehicles motorcycles cars everything that had one set fine amount a number of years ago council added a specific provision regarding motorcycles to its bylaw and set that fine at 250, which is higher than the provincial number. But other than that, things have not changed since then. Right, and then what is the amount set in the provincial legislation? 162. Okay, gotcha. Um, and so uh, so what I interpreted that part of the report where it says, you know, this these fine amounts will be an additional deterrent to non-compliance on top of whatever's in the base set by the provincial legislation. So as of typically our enforcement approach is like do the traffic safety act enforcement first before adding on to the city provisions. Is, am I understanding that correctly? So officers could use either. They could, if they encounter the offense, because the way that we've proposed the amendment, the wording is identical. So the same activities would trigger both the provincial act and the bylaw. Officers will decide what offense is most appropriate to ticket for. Okay. Um, and I was wondering about for people who, you know, like have a legitimate challenge with their car, it wasn't intentionally modified to be louder, but, you know, for whatever reason, or maybe lack of money to get something fixed on their car, like how does our officers discern between those uh, with that? 
So I think, and, and thanks for that question. I think this is something that we've brought up, uh, especially in mm -hmm. uh, GBA plus sections of past reports on vehicle noise is, is that very real possibility of people who have, you know, obviously, you know, family budget has to be extended in lots of different ways. And so if you if your muffler needs uh, fixing, but your kids also need food, then, uh, you know, there are some real life choices yeah. to be made there. And I think um, this is the this is the very reason why um, that officer discretion piece is written into uh, a whole host of legislation, not just this one, but just, uh, it, you know, making sure that they can they can kind of do those street side assessments and go, okay, this isn't somebody who's intentionally trying to create a whole bunch of noise. It's just, this is where they are in life. And I think that's uh, that's something that we always try to uh, yeah. impress upon our folks that uh, officer discretion is uh, is always warranted and um, encouraged. Yeah, perfect. Um, th no, I think uh, for that reassurance. Um, and I guess uh, lastly for now, um, typically when we do enforcement, there's lots of different things we explore. You know, fine amount is one tactic, but the other might be frequency of enforcement, recognizing that wasn't funded during the budget deliberation. Uh, this is why, you know, we're looking at fine amount as like kind of the other tool that we might have in the toolbox. Am I, is that understanding appropriate? Yeah, I think where, um, especially for the for the the, the motorcycle roadside testing um, with the existing bylaw, with the um, you know the decibel levels and all of that that we test, that's really uh, sort of static operations that we set up. So we set up in one location a hotspot where we get uh, you know uh, frequent complaints for vehicle noise, uh, and, and try to just whoever comes through gets tested. Uh, this uh, bylaw for, uh, you know, expanding it to all motor vehicles, um, you know, the, keeping in, in place the, the decibel level testing for motorcycles, um, but expanding the just sort of the noisy vehicle provisions into the bylaw uh, allows us to be a little bit more nimble. We don't need to do those roadside tests. It's, a, it's about the circumstance. It's about all of those subjective pieces that the, uh, the officers can testify to in court about uh, you know, the driver's behavior and, and you know, actions that led to uh, what would be considered the unreasonable noise uh, and, and allows I'm, that. I am way out of time. David, thank you. Sorry. So, so people who are virtually attending, if I start going like this, means hurry up. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, Costner Rutherford. Yeah, I had a similar line of questioning to Councillor Chang, and I I do understand that the original motion said, you know, a minimum of $1,000, but I guess would administration, you know, what would your advice be in terms of, you know, if we were to put another number or at least, you know, if there's no sil silver magic number, would it not be prudent to test with a smaller number how that deters and then report back? Right? Like I just it feels like such a big it, it feels like such a big jump. Thoughts on that? On on if that's practical to to say, okay, today the fine can be set at, you know, say five hundred or you know, four hundred or whatever, whatever that number is. And then in a year's time, did that was that effective? Did that deter people? What was the feedback we received? I think that's something that we could uh, test and monitor, but I, I might defer the, the the bulk of that question to Nancy. Yeah, I think we absolutely, Councillor Rutherford, could change that number. Uh, we'd need a motion today to do that, but it, it is entirely up to you whether you want to start with a higher number or you want to start with a sort of more of our standard fine amount of 250, which is what the current motorcycle fine is. Yeah, because I agree. I think that like having you know, treating all vehicles equal is important. So I think that definitely needs to be something we consider. I also, cause I also do worry about, I guess one of my other questions that I have based on some of the answers in the last round was, you know, that officer discretion, if they take a ticket of thousand dollars to court versus 162 for the same offense, could that person not say, I don't know why I got a thousand dollar ticket instead of the 162? Like, I'm just, I'm trying to understand like what kind of threshold, if there would be any threshold to sort of trigger that more uh, higher fine amount. Because the bylaws really quiet, like doesn't have anything that describes that on it. 
recommend it wouldn't, Councillor Rutherford, because it would be up to the officers based on the circumstances. But somebody can always raise that question. It wouldn't necessarily dictate the outcome because they are two different offenses and we have a, not a small number of situations where we have a duplicated bylaw offense that replicates exactly a provincial offense and the fine amounts are different. Okay. Um, can, can you like just walk me through if this bylaw was approved today, what that would look like in practice? Uh, so for both, you know, encountering a vehicle and the thousand dollar fine and when that would flip to the $2,000 fine? I can likely take on the first half of that and then Nancy, I'll defer to you on the, the flipping to the second half uh, or flipping to the 2000. Um, so as it stands right now, we have general duty peace officers and a couple of other uh, peace officer groups that support uh, the traffic enforcement piece across the city. Uh, obviously the EPS is a, is a larger partner in that, but um, but we do have some uh, resources that, that are involved in that activity, both uh, in partnership, but also on their own. And uh, as they are doing their routine business, driving across the city. Yeah, let's just talk about somebody intercepts, like some a police officer or yeah. a bylaw officer, I'm just mindful of my time, intercepts yeah. a person with a noisy vehicle. Okay, um, well, it'd just be a, a routine vehicle stop and determinations would be made uh, again uh, about the situation, about all the circumstances, whether it's, you know, the, the Anthony Hende or the, the White Mud or, you know, a, a residential neighborhood at three in the morning, there may be a, a little bit of difference in the officer discretion uh, with respect to what ticket to administer, but also um, their, their leniency on whether this is a warning or not. Uh, and then it would proceed from there. And with respect to when it would trigger to the 2000, uh, Nancy, can you uh, speak to that? It would only uh, go to 2000 if it was a subsequent conviction. So that would be after either the fine is paid or there's been a trial and the person's been found guilty. Then that doubling provision could come into play. Okay. Those are all my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice. I just have only one quick question. And then, does this bylaw and include modified bicycles equipped with motors? So, Councillor Rice, the bylaw isn't necessarily about modifications. It's about whether a vehicle on the roadway is making unnecessary and unreasonable noise. Uh, it doesn't have to be modified to do that. If the if the noise is unreasonable and necessary, the bylaw is triggered. And then um, I th I think I I want to restate my question. Um, so because I what I heard is there are a lot of people and then uh, actually really um, uh, <laughs> bothered by some um, bikes with the mod mo motors and with no sound control. So that is why, and I, I want to ask him, is this by like cover that type of equipment or only cover like motorcycles or vehicles? And then is the bikes with, with like no sound control or motors included? Yes, if it is qualifies under the very broad definition of vehicle under the provincial mm -hmm. legislation, then yes, then it would apply. Whether or not it, the noise is unnecessary and unreasonable will depend on the facts, but there's a potential for that door to be open, yes. Okay, thank you, that's my question. Thank you, Councillor, thank you, Councillor Rice, Councillor Wright. Thank you, Ms. Jacobson, so I'm just wondering, so if somebody's traveling with their noisy vehicle east on the white mud, and then they hit the Anthony Hende, their fine amount would only be $162 under the Traffic Safety Act? Uh, not necessarily. It's not based on location. It's based on which charge the officer chooses to issue. So at any roadway within the city of Edmonton, they could, if this bylaw is approved, choose to issue the bylaw offense or the existing provincial offense. But our peace officers can only um, fine within the city limits, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So if they made it out to the white mud, then the sheriffs could, or out to the hand day, then the sheriffs could pick them up and... And they would only be able to do 162, not the, not the city's bylaw of 1,000. Yes, once you leave the boundaries of the city of Edmonton, our bylaw doesn't apply. Okay, okay. And Mr. Jones, I, I think I recall asking you at um, 
CPSC committee, or sorry, the meeting, um, about enforcement. You would all, peace officers will only be looking at sort of the static hotspots, right? They don't necessarily have the equipment to, to check the decibel level, level of people on the go. So that that's correct. It's this. It's the Edmonton Police Service that has the uh, the decibel level uh, meters, and they they take the lead on that. Um, but typically, we do uh, uh, with with Project Tensor for the last three year, three or four years. We've done um, kind of joint uh, hotspot uh, locations where we set up, and then we're able to deal with both vehicles and the motorcycles because the motorcycle testing does take quite a bit of time. Uh, okay, so so for testing for the motorcycles, but then what about just other vehicles? Well, because of uh, the way that we have uh, or that we're proposing that this bylaw would be, uh, it, it's based similar to the Traffic Safety Act offenses that it's more on a subjective basis. So that's where I'm saying that the officers can explain, you know, the roadway, the time of day, how much noise was created if there are any precipitating factors, all of those pieces that will go into their court testimony to help prove the offense rather than it needing to be contingent on decibel readings. Okay, and so using, with the officer using their discretion, um, is that tracked if they use their dis discretion and decide not to issue it a ticket? Uh, I would have to take that away and find out for sure just with respect to our records management system. Okay, okay. I, I was just curious, you know, to see if there was certain areas maybe where more discretion was used than others. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, Councillor, thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. So, sorry, just a clarification. Uh, our bylaws still apply on the Anthony Henday, even though it's provincially owned, but it's within our uh, geographic jurisdiction? Correct. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, just want to really thank administration for bringing this forward. I think, uh, I think, you know, using the wording of the provincial legislation makes a, a ton of sense. Also really appreciate the conversation, uh, Mr. Jones, just to go around peace officers being able to do some more of that sort of spot, spot finding if they're encountering those problems as they're out and about and just empowering them to do that. Do we, and, and do we anticipate, um, I guess we're looking at frequency and severity of the fine, so frequency of receiving the fine, severity of the fine itself. Are we anticipating that the frequency um, in terms of the tensor uh, initiatives will, will remain sort of constant this summer? Like, do we have any reason to suspect that those will change or go down for any reason? Uh, I don't at this point. We've, uh, we've created our sort of our traffic pl safety plan for the year. I know the EPS has created theirs. We're still uh, kind of finalizing what those plans might be for those joint, joint operations. So I don't have a set schedule or anything. Um, we are, uh, f from the city perspective, we're committed to continuing those uh, if it's a viable option for both of us. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> so just, just to think that that will, that may be a good way for sort of keeping the frequency reasonably consistent to, to be able to kind of gauge how the severity of the fine is, is impacting overall outcomes. Uh, and just wanted to confirm too that, uh, you know, administration will certainly be sort of watching what the outcomes are and if you see any opportunities uh, to optimize it in terms of, again, maybe tweaking that fine amount or, or other recommendations, that's something you would come forward to us with? Or, or is there value in having a, a report back? Yeah, I think um, there's a... It, there's a, a number of different things that we're tracking. Obviously, we track those, uh, the complaints that we get with respect to vehicle noise. Um, you know, the, the EPS receives those, but we get those numbers from them. And uh, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's reasonable to say that, that we would track and see if there's uh, any change in behavior. That's something that we've been monitoring uh, over the last couple of years. And I think even with the Project Tensor, you know, those, those concerted efforts in hotspots at sort of peak times, uh, we're still watching and, and making sure that, that, you know, that, that there is a um, change in behavior, a positive change in behavior like we're wanting to see. So I think, um, you know, having a bylaw change like this, we would monitor those tickets. Obviously, we'd work with Nancy's team on uh, the outcomes in court and then, uh, and then go from there as far as whether this was a, a, an effective lever that we're pulling. 
great. Yeah, excellent to hear that that data collection uh, is on the go. So thank you. I look forward to moving first reading when the time is appropriate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you so much for this report and draft bylaw. Just, uh, I think just two, two lingering questions, and these are, um, yeah, directly, directly from constituents, really. Uh, and I think Councillor Rutherford was getting at it by asking what does this look like in practice? So just a little bit of further clarity. Um, I've heard some concerns that it might un unintentionally affect heavy vehicles in particular. Um, so just looking for a bit of assurance um, on, on that piece. Um, I'm not sure the exact definition of uh, what heavy vehicle is, but certainly the, um, the, 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 you know, the, the language of that bylaw, um, you know, talking about uh, kind of unnecessary loud noise. So, uh, you know, a fire truck, for instance, is a loud vehicle, but it's got some very real need to be traveling and creating noise. Uh, so I think those are all things that we take into consideration when we implement uh, and operationalize a bylaw like this. Great. Yeah, that's that's perfect and that makes sense to me um and then just a secondary one so oh this one was interesting um so so folks had flagged excessive stereo noise and i'm just wondering looking at the draft bylaw is it possible that that's actually covered what's what's administration's um read on that piece i'd agree with you councillor salvador it doesn't speak to what the source of the noise is it's any loud or unnecessary noise yeah okay that's very helpful. Um, that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. I'll be, be brief and speak to it when the time is appropriate. Thank you, Consul Salvador. Consul Jans. Thank you. I'll move the motion. Oh, Consul Stevens. Okay, sure. I'll okay. Well, so you're moving, the, you're moving I'll, the first reading? Yeah, I'll put it in. I'll okay. move the first reading. Second. Okay. All right, second by Councillor Stevenson. Okay. I have few a couple of questions, so I can't go to Councilor Jans do because... I, do I get to still have my five minutes, or does that void my... Oh, yeah, you can. You, you have questions? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, clarify. please. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, we had an extensive debate about this at the committee, so I don't want to rehash that. Um, but one question that came up for Mr. Jones, um, currently under the Traffic Safety Act, if you already modify your exhaust, that's illegal, correct? Uh, you're testing my old TSA knowledge, but yes, I believe that's correct. And I believe also if you already do this, you could be issued a summons for the infraction. You could be given a notice compliance form. Uh, you could be seized. You could have your license plate seized. Um, there's already some pretty extreme consequences. Is that correct? Might defer some of that to Nancy, but I know that uh, there's certainly there are orders or um, notices that we can put on getting vehicles fixed and back into that legal condition. Yeah. Short of a seizure, you're correct. Sir, uh, we're not. Uh, I'm looking at, I believe it's the fourth bullet. The officer may seize the license plate and not return it until the repairs are completed. Am I incorrect? <laughs> Um, no, but that has to follow after a direction has been issued. So it's, it, you're, there's two concepts going on there. It's not necessarily just because you did the modification. That would be about the direction power. Seizures are unfortunately a little complex under the provincial legislation. Right. Okay. I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's another legal comparison because some people have said, well, um, it's like sp speeding, but you know, speeding could be done accidentally. You could be driving at speed and, um, areas could change. But this, you have to actually get out a screwdriver or a blowtorch or whatever and modify your vehicle. Like, this is pretty extreme. I don't think any of us in this room have done this, although many of us may have inadvertently or accidentally sped or not come to a complete stop. So I'm wondering, is there another area of legislation that contemplates, like, a, a premeditated crime? Uh, premeditation really isn't a concept in the regulatory world of the provincial offenses, but the sanctions are higher, yes, where someone has done something like a peace officer has directed them to undertake repairs and they don't do it, then yes, the consequences are of course more severe than some of the others you've mentioned. So I've had a lot of constituents who I have pushed for sanctions that probably violate the Geneva Convention. And, and I said, no, we'll come in at $10,000. That's the suggested fine. But in hearing 
administration said, no, that's, that's probably too high for a first time. I suggested 5,000, and then the committee said, no, let's go back with a fill in the blank, and administration can, can come back with something that is more reasonable. And so I'm wondering if you could clarify the 1,000. The motion from committee was to return with a minimum fine amount of $1,000. So that, so that was the final decision, okay. Yes. And so administration, I hear you saying, you believe that is a tenable, a tenable amount. It's on the upper end of what I would recommend for a bylaw offense, but that was the direction from committee, so it's what we brought back. Right, um, and the doubling, that is, uh, that's also common in other infractions. We have that in nearly all of our bylaws, if, if not all, if not all. So the officer has the discretion not to handle the fine, but instead to offer a, uh, uh, what was that, a summons, a compliance? So if, in the case where we're dealing with an, a vehicle with some either mechanical issue or a modification, then yes, that is one option they can do is to direct the person to undertake repairs and they can do that with or without a ticket, but that, that is only available in that specific scenario. And about going after the shops that sell the illegal products, that's, I believe, currently, it's not illegal to sell the products, is that correct? Correct. So, but, and we have no bylaw uh, control over people selling illegal products? Well, because they're not illegal, we don't regulate it. Yes. Okay, but vape stores aren't illegal, or cannabis isn't illegal, but we have bylaw provisions. Yeah, we regulate their business operations in, to some extent, yes. Okay, well then that might be a consideration. If, if this small measure doesn't work, we may need to look at other measures, but um, for what it's worth, I've, I've heard from Red Deer, Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, other cities about this. Who is leading the way in um, I would say pe peaceable street noise. It really should be the province because this is something that does cross jurisdictional boundaries as Councillor Wright mentioned earlier. That should be where it is and it is most appropriately within provincial legislation. We can deal with the public community impacts in our bylaws, but regulating those broader issues that cross the boundaries is properly provincial. So all of those cities, like they've called and said, we love what Edmonton's doing, we want to do this too. But like, is there, is there another sort of gold standard that we look to as a city? Die. Uh, David, do you have one? I mean, I think there are a, 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 a oh, number Sorry, of I'm out of time. I apologize. David, can, can you quickly answer that question in 10 to 15 I would just say there are some folks leading on automated testing like Paris. Um, New York has done some of the what you're talking about with uh, regulatory bylaws for like shops, modifying vehicles, that type of thing. Okay, good. All right, we're going to take a break here, and we'll be back at uh, 347. Okay, until then, we are on the recess.
and Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Councillor Tang. Here. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Rice. Here. And Councillor Jans. Good evening. All right. So, Councillor Jans, you had more questions or uh, no, you, you, no. Conclu oh, you, you concluded? Um, oh, one, two, three, four. We, do we have quorum? Six, five of us here. Andrew, I can see. Okay, okay, we got quorum. Good. Okay. All right. Okay. Andrew, can you take the, uh, Councillor Nack, can you take the chair? I have a couple of questions. And uh, Councillor Stevenson is not here. And Councillor Jans moved to the chair. Then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, and I really want to follow up on Councillor Tang's line of questioning around. Uh, uh, discretion and the ability of the officers not to uh, you know, really punish people who may have a defected muffler or something, right? And uh, they just can't, or they can't afford to get it repaired quickly, right? I just want to know how, 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 do you, how do you take that kind of a compassionate approach to enforcement? David, if I, if I can start there. So there's two avenues where discretion comes into play. So first, at the ticket issuance point, the yeah. officer has the choice to choose the, the offense that they're going to charge with and choose whether or not they want to issue a warning. Yeah. And then if the person proceeds to court, there's also a secondary layer where our prosecutors have that ability to look at a ticket and decide whether or not it's in the public interest to proceed. Okay. So in practice, is there maybe this to David? Uh, do we have some data to kind of suggest that we actually do take that that kind of compassionate approach, where we would you can demonstrate? You know, look, we give you warning that we are giving more warnings, or uh, I just want to understand that we, in reality, we are practicing that approach. So I think um, I don't have any data to uh, to support this with respect to vehicle noise, but uh, I'll, I'll give you the uh, the equivalent. Um, in our transit safety spaces, we know that, uh, you know, there are some new bylaw provisions. We've done some education about, you know, that escalation of encouragement and, and engaging with folks and really educating them about uh, what the expectations are. Mm -hmm. And for those tickets, as we continue to monitor the, the ticket warning interactions, uh, we're looking at about 85% of the time where a ticket could be written. It's resulting in a warning or some other form of, uh, you know, just discretionary solution. And so I would suggest that, that that's gonna be the same case here. Okay. I mean, I think there are gonna be some very obvious uh, over reasons why we would wanna use this ticket. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we have, we have lots of other things. We still have the Traffic Safety Act uh, offenses so that if it weren't, you know, three in the morning and, and, and somebody with some sort of altered vehicle making all kinds of racket really disturbing people you know there there are lesser offenses that we can consider and then there are still the warnings and and other solutions that we can find as well so that kind of uh, approach is instilled into some of the education and training that officers get right that's correct okay, okay. Yeah. that's 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 good to know because the the whole purpose is to target those who deliberately disturb other people's peace right and uh, and deliberately make that excessive noise. Yeah, I think one of the things we do is we look at the intent as to why the bylaw was created and try, and try to put that into the way in which we administer it. Okay, got it. Okay, I just needed that assurance. All right, I will take the chair back. We have uh, bylaw 20364 ready for first reading, moved by Councillor Jens, seconded by Councillor Stevenson. Uh, ready to speak, uh, Councillor Paquette to speak. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I support this bylaw. Um, 
I, I think that there's a difference between intentional and, un, and unintentional or necessary and unnecessary noise. So sometimes uh, large vehicles uh, that the city uses, uh, like, like buses, can make a lot of noise and it can bother people. But that's a necessary uh, disturbance, uh, if you can call it that. Unnecessary or intentional disturbances are quite a different thing. Um, and that is when people are modifying their vehicles or uh, gunning their vehicles in such a way that um, there's actually no practical purpose for that. And that disturbs the peace and is it is not necessary for the functioning of the city. Those types of things, I think, uh, people have said loud and clear, they are just tired of it. And literally tired when they're, when they're woken up at three in the morning. Now, this does not extend to the Hende, which is where some of this also occurs, but we will make a difference where we can. And because there is that discretion, so if someone has a catalytic converter stolen, or as you referenced, Mr. Mayor, that there would be a problem with the muffler and it's gonna take a bit of time to get repaired, okay, we can show that sort of, uh, that leniency and that compassion and that understanding in the way that these uh, fines are levied. And then of course, as mentioned uh, by Mr. Jones, there's that secondary level of discretion at the court system, whether or not this is um, in, the, in the benefit of the public. And so there are checkpoints to ensure fair, fairness. But one thing that, uh, that uh, the public has very, very clearly said, loud and clear, below the decibel level though, is that uh, they want to see some firm action taken here. And so if that encourages, if this bylaw encourages people to think twice about how they're interacting with public spaces, that can only be a good thing. And the goal is not to punish people. The goal here is to discourage, frankly, anti-social behaviors that uh, are not conducive toward building community, building, uh, you know, that expectation of enjoyment of people's properties and of the public realm. Very easy to support. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Nack. Thanks, Mayor Sovi. Uh, so similarly, uh, I'll be supporting this. And, it, you know, over the time I've been on council, it, it didn't come up a lot uh, originally until the ward boundary changes. And uh, I started to serve the communities of uh, McQueen, uh, North Glenora and Glenora, where speeding along uh, or rather rather noisy vehicles along Grout Road in 107th became uh, was, was often getting raised. I heard that a lot. Um, and and what really jumped out at me was uh, it was coming from a wide variety of people. It was coming from folks not just immediately adjacent to those roads. It was coming from folks, you know, on the other side of the community and and the frustration that they were feeling around how long there has been inaction on this uh, and and the desire to see something that might help deter this because uh, for some of these roads, as, as I'm sure is the case in many other parts of the city, uh, once we hit that spring weather, it becomes a, a nightly occurrence. I mean, I can hear, even from where I live, I can hear a little bit of it uh, from some of those roads uh, which is rather astonishing because for as far away as I am of those roads to be able to hear the sound coming from that, I, I can't begin to imagine how actually challenging that is for the folks who've been sort of living that every night. So um, I think this is an important step. And, and the reason I'm comfortable with this uh, and, and what is a higher fine amount is for that conversation that has been had between the questions that Councillor Tang asked and the questions that Mayor Sophie asked around discretion and making sure that, you know, what we wanna focus on are those who are knowingly creating significant issues for residents and Edmontonians. Um, we're not looking to penalize folks who uh, have a broken muffler and, you know, are struggling and need to bring up the money to get to where they need to. So uh, this is very much about those who have knowingly gone out of their way to create challenges. So 
I'll be supporting this. The, the only caution I'll, I'll offer is that I do worry, and I know we, we didn't approve it in the budget at this point, is, is the need for potentially more dedicated enforcement officers to be able to, to sort this out. While there has been some good work over the last few years, um, I, I'm a little worried that we don't quite have enough um, support to be able to, to do the work we'll need to do, but uh, we'll see how that goes this year. And then we can, as, as with everything we do, we can revisit in the year's time, uh, uh, maybe as we come up to budget, if we found that uh, there's still a big issue, maybe we do need to then look at, at uh, further uh, enforcement resources so that, that can be done. So I'll support this. Uh, thanks for the work on it. And, uh, and hopefully this begins to make a difference for uh, for those community members who've been dealing with this for for in some cases decades, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you, um, and thanks again for this report and the draft bylaw. Uh, I will also be supporting it, and yeah, I've just been reflecting on the conversations that I have had with folks on the doors and excessively noisy vehicles actually came up on a really regular basis. I was I was a little surprised by that, but it definitely turned into a pattern and. Uh, it made it clear to me that there are certain hotspots and locations that are worse than others. Um, and I've heard from a broad range of Edmontonians who are quite frankly tired of putting up with inconsiderate motorists who are blasting through their neighborhoods and main streets. Um, and I've shared this in the past, but I thought it's important to reiterate from my perspective, this is an economic issue uh, as much as it is a health issue and a quality of life issue. There are real economic consequences associated with the noise pollution from these particular road users, whether it's having you know, a barrage of interruptions while you're having dinner on a patio or simply while you're trying to sleep. There are downstream outcomes and consequences. Uh, so I think today's bylaw is a step in the right direction. And while it's not a silver bullet, it's one tool in our toolbox that can act as a meaningful deterrent to unnecessarily noisy vehicles that disrupt and disturb our neighborhoods. So um, thank you for the discussion. Happy to support it. Thank you, Consul Salvador. Consul Tang. Yeah, great. Thank you uh, very much. Um, we, I know we've had some pretty extensive uh, conversation about this. Um, and uh, I've had, you know, since the, this discussion has been very public, you know, I've received lots of feedback from residents in, in War Gadahia who wanted to make sure I tell, you know, everyone here that a uh, noisy vehicle isn't just a central neighborhood or downtown core issue uh, that uh, many residents are experiencing it uh, in the suburbs too, close to the Hyundai uh, and, and, and various roadways. And I think um, and I know that you know we're we're, we're not alone in, in these neighborhoods, uh, so certainly it has an impact on people's quality of life. Um, and I think this is I think this is important. You know what is the magical number? I feel like you know we've heard a lot of discussion about there there is no magical number, but um, uh, it is higher end. And I think you know there was some pretty significant discussion around uh, how serious do we want with with penalty. Um, I. You know, I, I, I'm very cognizant that we did not approve the additional resource because of fiscal constraint. Um, and so I think talking about, you know, uh, increasing fine amount uh, it is important as it's one of the many things on the table here and that we should and we should explore that. The other thing I thought that was very interesting um, uh, that didn't quite maybe get as much attention is that bring it in line with um, with the fines for for motorcycles, you know, some of the feedback I've heard from the community is the worry that motorcyclists are, are going to be disproportionately targeted. But in this case, I think you know, I think being consistent between those vehicles, I think, is important. Um, you know, I guess just uh, lastly, I think I, I just want to say uh, I'm I'm reminded. Uh, I know we've we've had this messaging several times in our info session uh, to talk about our. Uh, by law enforcement approach that is the four E's that engage, educate, encourage, and enforce that there are other ways of trying to change behavior that we, 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 see, you know, we do before really kind of, uh, doing, uh, doing the fines. Um, uh, and so I am confident that, you know, um, our bylaw officers will continue to take that approach, uh, including in this area. So, uh, I, you know, I am, I'm, I'm happy to support this. I, 
I, I, I'm also happy that we take um, sort of a monitor and see and kind of, you know, what, what, what is the progress and, um, and if, if no, if that resource constraint continues to be a problem, absolutely, we should revisit that piece, um, which is not really the piece we're talking about today, but I think we should uh, look at that since we kind of need a bit of a co co cohesive um, approach to to address this challenge that I think historically has been uh, a challenge to to enforce. Um, yeah, I I know some of the comments may have come up during committee, but I I'm I'm, I'm glad that they're being kind of brought up again uh, today. And thank you for the the work on the bylaw. Um, I will be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm very pleased to support this bylaw today. Uh, through door knocking and, and in the past year and a half, uh, I'd say in terms of no excessive vehicle noise has been uh, the most consistent issue in terms of that, that quality of life uh, piece that I've heard from, from community members. Um, what I have really appreciate about these conversations that we've had, you know, both at committee and at council is I think it's really demonstrated that there, there is a huge impact. Again, this isn't a small group of people that, that are annoyed. Um, this is a very broad segment of our community. And my hope is that um, as we've talked about this issue, um, those that choose to modify their vehicle have, have had a chance to really hear and understand the impact that it's having on their neighbors. Um, and that they may uh, choose to make different, different choices moving forward. Uh, and, and for those that don't, I'm, I'm pleased that we will now have a stronger tool in our toolbox to address excessive vehicle noise. Um, as others have alluded to, you know, I think this is a, a first step. I, I'm hopeful that we'll see some, some good outcomes from this. Uh, and then certainly continue to monitor the need for potential uh, additional frequency of, of enforcement as well as we move forward. But thank you again to administration for bringing this forward and I look forward to supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. And it's always challenging being a dissenting voice. I will start off and preface this with I am going to support this bylaw. But I do, I did feel an incumbent to bring up a few things that are on my mind or that made me feel a little bit leery about supporting. First and foremost, I actually haven't gotten that is. I have a lot of things that people reach out to me in my office about and noisy vehicles outside of city vehicles or snow vehicles or buses isn't really high on the list. Um, that being said, that doesn't mean it's not happening elsewhere in the city and it's not important. It is absolutely important to address. And I was really heartened to learn that we, the bylaw is silent on, you know, the, the source of the noise, because one of the original things I was thinking about was all the honking and excessive honking that happened recently in our downtown. And so I, I think there is definite benefits of, of putting this in, um, you know, and, and I do understand the perspective that this was debated thoroughly at committee, but I'd also like to highlight that a bylaw process is different and that uh, this is the first time that we're seeing the bylaw in its totality. And so we debated the intent of the bylaw, but it's always important and incumbent on us as governors to thoroughly examine the bylaw in the context of its totality. Um, and so I don't think it's, it's out of line to ask those questions again in the council space. Um, and with that said, I think going forward for any committee and the committees that I'm on, I'm gonna be more aware of such directives of the exact amounts for any fines or bylaws because I think what I would have preferred to have seen is a different approach in terms of asking administration to make a recommendation or an, put an amount in the bylaw that they felt was a, a substantive deterrent, whatever that amount was, rather than setting it at $1,000 uh, as a minimum. We do have a problem with crime and social disorder and, and antisocial behavior. But again, I keep going to the fact that I don't see the answer in enforcement. I don't think that that is the way, we do not enforce our way out of those issues. 
uh, you know, we, we, we work our way out of those issues through community building and connection and uh, social, yeah, social rules of engagement that we believe in because there's a social societal fabric that ties us together. And I know that's very high level and doesn't help in the immediate, but I hope that we continue to keep our eyes on how are we working together as a council and as a city to address behaviors in other ways beyond enforcement. So that be enforcement is, of course, and always will be a tool, but it is not our de facto tool all the time. Um, uh, so, so with that, I, I again, I wanna thank everybody that put time and effort into developing this bylaw and for the debate that was had at committee and for Councillor Jans for bringing up the issue and for advocating so uh, eloquently for an issue that was really big in his ward. And so, you know, it's always uh, courageous to take that first step and, and lead the way. So thank you everyone for your work on this. And thank you for listening to some of my uh, other thoughts as we as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Wright. Um, thank you. I will be supporting this as well um, because I have gotten uh, a number of uh, emails and, and conversations with constituents uh, in the ward. Um, and, and, I, and I do, I do like the fact that we are um, aligning um, the, the fine amounts. Um, a thousand is, is a lot. And I'm, I hope it does act as a deterrent because the emails and conversations that I've had also not only include the noisy vehicles, but also um, the speeding in the neighborhoods. Um, and with the, you know, being right along the, the white mud and the hen day, which in Ward Spomatapi is not part of city limits, <laughs> just to point that out. Um, um, I, I think there's, there's a lot that can be done to uh, slow traffic down, make it more, you know, quieter. Um, and um, like I said, hope, hopefully this will act as a deterrent for people. And I'd also hope that we have the, the support of our other um, um, enforcement uh, organizations because I, I don't know if, if our peace officers um, have, the, have the ability, the, the resources, the tools um, lacking the, the decibel meters. Um, so like I said, I hope that we do have uh, support from our other organizations to assist us. So thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. I really want to take a moment to thank Councillor Jans for his uh, persistent advocacy on this and really standing up for his constituents uh, and uh, and listening to their concerns and bringing those concerns to uh, to the committee and uh, and to th through that process, this bylaw in front of us and uh, and uh, as well as other council members too, right? It's very very important that we reflect those voices. Uh, uh, I also appreciate that administration does apply a compassionate approach to enforcement. Uh, you know, education is part of that. Awareness is part of that. Uh, engagement, yes, enforcement is the last tool in some of those uh, uh, those cases. And also making this distinction, in, in my mind, I am, I'm making this distinction that uh, uh, in this case, uh, our, our motivation or objective is not to target those who, you know, uh, are in circumstances where their vehicle is broken or uh, somehow a muffler is broken or uh, other defects that are not of their cause, right? And they want to get them repaired and take some time to do that. That's not what the intent is. The intent is to target those who deliberately, deliberately disturb other people's peace and quality of life. Whether they do that through modification of the vehicles that they have or just doing it in a further own pleasure without even you know, being considerate of uh, the impact of uh, on on other other people. Um, you know, hindsight, I wish that we had this bylaw in place last summer when uh, people in the downtown communities went through such a 
terrible, terrible time uh, when all these uh, convoy protesters were honking their horns constantly, deliberately disturbing people's peace, right? And I think that's the kind of behavior that we need to uh, need to discourage and target, and uh, and uh, and that's where enforcement is. Uh, is necessary, right? And uh, and we see that on White Avenue, we see that 118th Avenue, and other areas, right? So I think uh, uh, that's that's where I would like to see our focus being on the on the enforcement. So look forward to uh, the outcome, and look forward to monitoring this how, how it works, and and what other other tools might be necessary for us. Okay. Okay. All right. With that, I will take the chair back and go to Councilor Jans to close. Just to vote. Okay. All right, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, second reading. I'll move second reading. Second. Second by Councillor Stevenson. Please vote for the second reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move third reading. Second. We need consideration, right? Consideration. I'll move consideration of third reading. Yeah. Second. Okay. Okay, please vote for the consideration of third reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move third reading. Second. Okay, vote for the final reading, please. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Good. We are on to motion spending, right? All right. Multi-year dedicated climate levy. Councillor Salvador. Sure, thank you. Um, and the clerk should have some slightly updated wording. Um, I'll read it in. That administration provide a report with options for a dedicated climate fund, including potential parameters and funding amounts in alignment with the energy transition strategy. I'll second that. Yes, we do have that. And if we could just also confirm that it, that restatement uh, has unanimous consent. Yeah, we're just change, changing the word from levy to fund, right? That's Seems correct. fine. Okay, everyone is okay with that? Changing the word from levy to fund? Yeah. I see nobody raising any any objections. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Great, and may I introduce? Yeah, go ahead, please, Thank yeah. Um, yeah, so this motion comes from a number of observations that arose out of the four-year budget process that made it apparent to me that we need to be more intentional with our approach to funding the energy transition strategy. Um, and I'll just go through a few, a few of those points. So first, the energy transition strategy calls for 300 million of annual investment with one third contributions from the city, the province and the federal government. And of course, that is a significant amount. And trying to piece that together every budget cycle it's going to be very challenging if it's not done in an intentional manner. Um, you know, not only do we need to see significant investment in terms of the scale and magnitude, uh, but we need to be strategic with those investments to ensure that we're leveraging dollars from other orders of government as well as the private sector. Um, so I think that you know, a, a dedicated fund may allow us to do that more consistently. Uh, and then second, I would say that we've heard loud and clear from Edmontonians that climate action is a priority, uh, not only throughout the bu budget process itself, but through extensive engagement as part of the city plan and the energy transition strategy. And we also know it's been identified as council's priority as well. Um, and then I would also point to the carbon budget. You know, as we all know, it shows 
clear evidence that we're not on track to meet our targets and that the scale of change we need to see in order to meet them will require dedicated funding. Um, and I think it also is interesting in the context of, of Edmonton's declared climate emergency. I think that a necessary step of that declaration is to set ourselves up for success by, by having um, yeah, sustainable and ongoing funding to actualize all of the, um, the, the components of that strategy. Uh, so yeah, I will leave it there and just be, be really clear that this motion is just to allow us to consider options for, for a potential fund. Um, it would generate a report with potential parameters and funding amounts. Um, and of course, no decision is being made as part of this motion just to report for future consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Questions, colleagues? Uh, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Only one question, and as they come back to the executive committee, is not come back to the council, and is there any specific reason for that? Reports, reports go to committees first, right? Then, for a committee discussion, then come to council. Maybe clerk can. I would only add uh, the important part would be the opportunity for the public to speak. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, climate climate change and like energy transition strategy is a, for this type of funding is under the executive committee? Yes, we've assessed that it's likely under the mandate okay. of executive okay. committee. Yes, sorry, Councillor Rice, I didn't understand that. It yeah, I, I just is under like the urban planning or any other like committee, I was wondering. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Thank you, Councillor Rice, Councillor Tang. Uh, great. Thank you so much um, for putting this forward. Uh, I guess uh, you have mentioned other levels of government. Um, during the budget process, I had also put forward uh, a motion around federal funding um, advocacy, um, given that the scale of funding needed to achieve all of our goals in our energy transition plan, uh, city you know, property tax base is simply unsustainable. Um, I'm wondering if you can just reconcile those two for me a little bit and how do you see the two intersect? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, you know, I think as a municipality, we have a number of tools that are within our control. And, but as you pointed out, it is going to take far more than, than municipal commitment to see the scale of change that we need. So I see this as a way for us as a municipality to be intentional about our approach, which I think will help open the door for leveraged funds from other orders of government. So when I look at that breakdown in the energy transition strategy of a third, a third, a third, I think this is a, a way for us to have a conversation about how we ensure that our third is there in a consistent way. That's great, thank you. Um, and I also think your clarification at the end there is uh, is very helpful because you know it's not uncommon that we have reports such as this that looks at alternative funding. You know, I'm thinking of you know the transit one for example, and something a report that comes back would provide benefits and constraints too, right? I imagine. That's my intention. Um, I mean, that can also be directed over to administration, but uh, that's what I would expect for this type of information options-based approach. Yeah, I don't know if administration want to add anything to that. Um, Feel free. Councillor Tang, the only thing we'd add is that we, we recognize that the municipal government cannot fulfill all of the commitments as outlined in the energy transition strategy, we, so we would for sure address that in this report when we, when we bring that back. That's great. Um, and then just one clarity, uh, so a fund like this, you are, you would be considering for, you know, future budget cycles. Uh, but again, based on what those constraints, benefits, parameters are. That's correct. Thank you. Sorry, Mayor, we missed who seconded that. I seconded that. Thank you very much. Yeah, no. Uh, thank you. Con thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Principe? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, this report will be going to executive committee. This is, I guess, to the city clerk. Would it actually be coming to, uh, to council after executive committee? Is this something that is passed at executive or at council? My so, under, I think uh, I will answer as much as I know in terms of what would be in the, the report. If it 
if it's for information, then it could be just received for information at executive committee. If there's any type of motion, of course, uh, that would have an impact to budget, that would need to come back to council. Okay, that's great. Thank you. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe, Councillor Jens. Can you take the chair? So, just to, this is to uh, to administration, maybe to Stephanie. Like, I kind of I see this in a way that we have the federal government created this rapid housing initiative, right? And they made money available. Then we wanted to be ready. Then we created a fund that allowed us to tap into that federal funding, right? So having kind of a dedicated funding for climate change, there are a number of opportunities at federal and provincial level that, that require matching. So instead of sc scrambling for resources in the last minute, this kind of fund will allow us to leverage those kind of opportunities, right? That could be one benefit of the fund for sure. Yeah, because that's how can I, I one, one, I one advantage that, uh, that, that I see, right? And I, I know Councillor Tang mentioned about the federal advocacy. I know FCM is doing a lot of work in that area as well, right, around uh, how federal government can better support municipalities in uh, helping achieve net zero goals by 2050. That, that's absolutely correct. And I think what's key here is that the municipal government can't do this alone, that we yeah. need to collaborate with other levels of government, also with private sector as well. Yeah, okay, so this, and you, do you see this kind of broad enough in that sense that uh, uh, if there are opportunities to leverage private sector funding with the, if we have a federal uh, if we have a municipal fund? I see this motion is broad enough for us to explore that as an option for using the fund. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, yep. that's well, that's great then. Good. All right. Uh, I will take the chair back. And so that concludes the questions. Anyone to speak? Okay, Councillor Paquette to speak, go ahead, please. Yeah, just really quickly, I, I fully support this. I think it's a great idea um, in exploring all the options and obviously it's not just uh, um, uh, for Edmonton, it, it expands to other levels of uh, government. And I would be remiss to say, uh, folks at home viewing cannot see this, but if uh, Peter Clark had facial hair, he would have the perfect look. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't, I saw Peter Clark very briefly on the screen. P Peter, maybe you want to turn your camera on so we can, <laughs> maybe not, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, Councillor Paquette. Anyone else? Okay, Councillor Salvador to close? No, okay. All right, please vote. We're just waiting on two votes. Councillor Hamilton, are you still in the meeting? Okay. Councillor Hamilton, we're not able to hear you, but it looks like you are trying to speak. Can you now? I mean, yeah. Yes, thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We got all the votes now? Yes, apologies, okay. we have all the votes. So please display the votes. That is carried. Carrying on, number 10.2, seniors promotion rate for city-owned recreational centers Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. I would like to restate my motion. I have this motion from like budget deliberation. And since the budget decision already made, and then also the MIMO come out, and a little bit slightly wording, and maybe one, two words changed. So I move that administration develop a new seniors promotion rate for city owned recreation centers to encourage participation in non-pink 
non-peak hours at the city recreation facilities, including uh, walking tra tricks, walking tracks. Second. Oh, second by Councilor Principe. Hey. Okay, thank you, Councilor Principe. Councilor Rice, can you please introduce the item? Uh, Sorry, I'll just yes. interrupt for one moment. And on this one as well, we'll need unanimous consent for the restatement. So what is the wording change? Sorry? The wording just uh, including walk, walking tricks. So it, that part yeah. is included, yeah. right? Yeah. That is okay. I think everyone is fine with that, right? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead, Councilor Rice, to uh, please introduce the item. Okay, so the intent, the intent behind this motion is to foster and encourage and promote seniors' physical and mental and social well-being through access to city of Edmonton recreation facilities walking tricks. So our recreation facility offer a safe place for seniors to walk, connect with others, and be involved in the community. And specifically, uh, city administration and in general is this year provide the MIMO. And I really appreciate that including some new promotion rates. Uh, the gap in that MIMO is uh, long pink hours is not included uh, for the specific promotion rates. So why this long pink hours is important and because our seniors can take this uh, time, you usage this time and then for long pink hours when our uh, recreation center not too busy and to participants uh, and to use the facility. Um, I think that piece um, also I heard many uh, demands and from the community as well. So I'm going, I will have a few questions to get a clarification and yeah. after. Yes. Okay, so Councillor Rice, you want to go to uh, questions next then? Go ahead. Okay. I'll I start your, we'll start your time again. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, um, I just want to ask administration, and, and because the MIMO and not, does not include the non-pink hours at the city recreation facility, so is that possible and for the uh, city uh, department, including this part in that MIMO and without the motion? Yes, we are able to uh, do the spirit of what you're asking without a motion. Uh, that's wonderful. That is the one I want to confirm if they could add that piece and specifically to include and for seniors to use walk walking tracks and that would be really helpful because the request I received and specific how our seniors can use the walking tracks and in that other city is doing the same thing and they give the promotion rates and to centers for only use walking tricks and then add long pink hours. Yeah, we will, uh, we would also like to get the opportunity to even look more broadly about the program that we can provide to seniors, uh, including walking tracks, but other things as well. I think that our youth uh, after school pass is a, uh, an example of what it looks like to uh, focus in on certain hours that are underutilized uh, in order to meet the needs of specific demographics. Okay, so that is a confirmation I need, and then because with that, and then we don't need this motion, I can withdraw the motion. Okay, so Councillor Rice is going to withdraw this, uh, uh, but like all the work that you're doing doesn't doesn't need to be limited to seniors only, right? You yep. can look at other uh, users that are, have say mobility challenges and other uh, other barriers, right? So some of this stuff that you're going to reconsider or look at, right, so. Well, my, my understanding is to focus on seniors, but we also have uh, focused on youth and uh, when other demographics come about that we can think about non-peak hours that can benefit their utilization, we certainly can do that. But um, as my understanding is that, that seniors are, is the focus of this particular work. Yeah, of course, but if the motion is withdrawn, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, then you'll look more broadly, not just seniors only. Absolutely. Okay, good, okay, good. All right, uh, Councillor Rutherford, you have a question because uh, motion, motion is being withdrawn. Well, I have I have a question about whether I'm going to give you unanimous consent to withdraw it. Okay, go so ahead. I, so I so that's why I'm asking the question. Go ahead then. Um, so I guess the one thing I I think about is so they're already doing this work as part of in scope of the current budget, so this won't have any budgetary impacts. 
No, we don't anticipate any budgetary impacts. Okay, that was it then. Then I can, I'm fine with the withdrawal. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Okay, so motion is withdrawn. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, next one is also from Councillor Rice, which is 10.3, assisted snow programs. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mayor Selhi. Uh, I move that state uh, administration provided the reports on the following: previous assist snow removal programs provided by the by the city of Edmonton, and the current assisted snow removal programs or initiatives underway. Juris Jurisdictionary scan of assistance snow remove programs across Canada, including looking at the current program implemented by Calgary for the special needs assistance for seniors benefit program. And summary of potential opportunities for assistance snow remove programs for Edmonton, as well as estimate of resources and cost implications. Okay, I'll, I'll second, second that. Oh, sorry, who did I hear seconded? Oh, I, uh, somebody else's is fine. I was seconded. That's okay. Okay. I'll, okay. And sorry, I'll, I'll second that. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And sorry, there are also, uh, because this is a restatement, and I would just draw attention to point three, where the uh, restatement is referencing Calgary and the special program for seniors, whereas the original statement referred to jurisdictional scanning in North America. Uh, so there is some wording change uh, that we need unanimous consent for. So the change would only focus on Calgary then, right, instead of North American jurisdictions? No, it's Cal uh, Canada. Change North American to Canada, and uh, including Calgary. Oh, I see. Okay, so the bullet third changes implemented. Looking at the current program implemented by Calgary for special needs assistance for seniors' benefits, Okay. Okay. Is so you just one. It, it would allow more focused attention on Calgary's program, right? That's right. The scope has decreased. Okay. But, but we would still need uh, unanimous consent. Yes, everyone is okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, that's great. Uh, okay, Councillor Rice, can you make the introduction, please? Uh, yes, uh, so my intent behind this motion is to bring attention and action to a challenge that many Edmontonians face in our winter city and snow shoveling. So we know it's important for everyone to ensure that their property is safe for pedestrians, but this can be especially uh, difficult uh, to, uh, for older adults and also some like special needs and then for some uh, our uh, citizens, and for example, somebody just uh, get a surgery, they cannot shove all their snows as well. Um, then, and the less able to, and who may not have the physical ability and to shovel snow as well. Uh, this is why it's critical for Edmonton to step in and provide assistance to seniors who need help clear snow. Uh, our city did have program before, but the program was canceled. Um, was canceled, and then what I heard from many seniors and also from some um, special needs um, with like the ability and then limited to do this, those physical work and they need some support and help. So I hope uh, this report come back and will prop provide some clear way and a forward to ensure no one sidewalk is left unshoveled because of age, ability, or means. And specifically, and our neighbor, uh, Calgary City, is implement that uh, home maintenance um, program, and specifically for seniors, and for some special needs. And then they get this program to help citizens actually the build to province. And so I think uh, this report will provide opportunity for our city administration to look at that, if that possibility could use it for our city as well. 
Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, uh, just to administration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, by the way. Um, our Snow Angels program uh, ended in 2018. And I guess the question would be why? Uh, Councillor Paquette, it's Gord Seberg. Um, I don't have the specifics in terms of all of the uh, details as to why it ended, but so the Snow Angels program, we actually didn't uh, do any uh, snow removal with city forces. We acted as a, a facilitator, and yeah. um, part of that was we would have different groups uh, support uh, the volunteer aspect. We didn't actually co coordinate individual, um, say, uh, pairing uh, uh, a citizen with, uh, with a volunteer. That was done through that ANGELS program. But that would be something we would look at in terms of how we would uh, apply it to uh, going forward. Yeah, okay, yeah, understood. Uh, so basically, it, the reason it ended wouldn't have had anything to do with Edmonton's participation, but through the Snow Angels program itself? I, I believe there, there were some, uh, some restrictions in terms of what they could supply, but we would include that in terms of, uh, you know, the report and and why it ended, and then what we would need to do to uh, reinstate. Was it sort of an occupational health and safety issue? Uh, I, I think there's there's OHS components we we consider as well as um, in terms of uh, pairing volunteers with with specific. Uh, all recipients of the service and how involved we can get. I would ask uh, Ms. Jacobson to just provide a little bit of uh, uh, more detail on that. Thanks, Gord. It, there'd be a number of things that this report would have to look at in terms of those risks. OHS is certainly one of them, other privacy and potential liability concerns, but a report back would certainly cover all of that off for Council's consideration. Okay, great. Now, I think the bones of this report already exist through the uh, options for new service enhancements uh, that came to us last summer. So this doesn't really look like it would be a lot of work, would it? I think what we would want to do is update uh, the jurisdictional scan and if Calgary has implemented any uh, specific enhancements to the program, we'd want to get that information as the motion identifies. But we'd also, you know, last year we identified what we would see as a, an opportunity to provide a service, but we didn't go into a lot of detail in terms of um, the specifics of, of what the program would contain, and I think that's what we would identify in this report. Councillor Paquette, can I stop you for a minute? Please, uh, uh, colleagues joining virtually, if, you, if you're in the meeting, please turn your camera on, because we are just about to lose quorum if, you're, if, the, if I don't see you. There we go. Good. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Constable Paquette. Oh, actually, uh, ironically, that was it. Uh, this all sounds great to me. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good. All right, Constable Right. Thank you very much. Um, I guess the Calgary program is just specifically targeted to seniors, and I think it's drawing on some provincial funds that I think we should take advantage of, too. But the report itself won't won't just deal with the seniors aspect, it will be for those with mobility, limited mobility and challenges yeah, there? I think, Councillor, when we look at this, we would definitely look at what other um, sectors of, of the public would need that support, and we would include that as well. Okay. And will that also include sort of results on, the snow, on this year's Snow to Go program? Like who accessed it and... So there was... Not not a lot in terms of this year's snow to go program. Perhaps um, uh, Mr. Jones can provide a little bit of oversight, but there were some some limitations in terms of what we could actually deliver uh, because of some of the restrictions that um, Nancy Jacobson had mentioned. Okay, Mr. Jones, um, I can speak for that. Okay. Uh, as, as part of the work of this report, we could certainly uh, provide uh, any of the findings from the snow to go program this past year. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So that concludes the questions. Anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Rice to close. Um, 
Thank, thank you, uh, Mayor Sohi, and we'll be very quick. I know our city and is a great place and then try to put lots of effort to create that uh, senior friendly city and to support seniors. Uh, also, we we do have like the one thousand dollars for community league to apply to support seniors. However, that program right now is underutilized, and because almost close to two hundred community leagues, only twenty five community league applied to do that. Uh, I think this report will provide some information, explore some opportunity, and then uh, Calgary is doing and how we can take that opportunity for us to enhance our support to seniors and specifically for the winter city and from like physically, mentally health and then uh, quality of life and also is contributed to our community safety as well and in the winter. So I encourage my uh, colleagues to support that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. I'm yes. Thank you, Councillor Rice. I'm yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. I'm yes. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. All right, carrying on to 10.4, real-time traffic monitoring review. Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. We're going to just uh, have a little bit of updated wording to help uh, help make sure concerns are alleviated on that. So I will uh, restate the motion that administration complete a review of other jurisdictions to identify what is required to have real-time or close to real-time traffic volume measurement and to implement traffic dependent signals across Edmonton to improve traffic flow for all modes of transportation. This report is to include number one, cost differences for different types of traffic signals and traffic equipment. Number two, ways to incorporate this work with other transportation network projects. Number three, the ability of reducing or eliminating pedestrian buttons as part of improving traffic movement for everyone. And number four, identifying changes to design practices that would be required to formally define signal prioritization to include all modes of transportation. So what is the change, sorry, in the wording, Councillor Nack? Used to, there, there, uh, some of the words that were sent by admin uh, included traffic uh, detection and uh, monitoring, and I just thought it would be more appropriate, especially based off some of the recent conversations, to, to make it clear what we're actually talking about. Okay. And to I'm sure that's second. frankly okay. Need a seconder? Second. Oh, was Councillor Paquette second that? Uh, and Councillor Knack, I think it's just that introductory Paquette. piece. Are you just able to send that to us? I don't have that language. I want to make sure we capture Oh, it. yes. Sorry. It was sent to the clerks uh, uh, on Wednesday, and we have changed. So I will send it over to you right now. Okay. And can you please make the introduction? Yes, of course. Thanks, uh, Mayor Sophie. So uh, high level, the, the idea here, a few years back, we looked at uh, smart traffic signals and there was a pilot that ran on 101 Street. And the, uh, the basis behind that was to see if we can have um, traffic waiting at lights for less time than they currently do. And not just vehicle traffic, but obviously vehicle traffic. Also people who are walking and people biking, people on transit. Um, Unfortunately, the, the pilot didn't work out the way that I, I think we were hoping. We didn't necessarily see the results. Um, and yet, at the same time, I, I'm still seeing in other jurisdictions where they have uh, traffic signals that take, for example, you know, if somebody was out last night driving uh, and they're stopped at a light and there's no traffic coming in the other directions for, you know, as far as your eyes can see, but the light is set on a pre-programmed timing signal versus being able to recognize hey, there's no traffic coming in the other direction. There's somebody waiting here. We're just going to change the light, let that car get through, and then go back to the regular frequency. So there are jurisdictions. Amsterdam's a really good example of this, where the traffic signals will adjust on the fly based off what traffic is actually doing and if there's there's uh, traffic close by. So I wanted to get see to find out why it's working maybe in those other areas and what maybe we can do to try to better incorporate that here in the city of Edmonton. Uh, the other specific note I'll, I'll uh, flag is in point three. Uh, I, I, I had used the word beg button in point three uh, because I think that's how they are affectionately referred to as uh, anyone who uh, walks regularly, but the pedestrian buttons, the ones you have to push in order to cross, 
I'd like to see how we can either uh, significantly reduce how long folks have to wait or, or eliminate for some of the same reasons. Uh, I hear from time and time again, folks who walk all the time that they push that button, no cars coming in either direction for as far as the eyes can see, yet they're stuck waiting for 60 seconds uh, because they can't go. So uh, wanting to see if we can better uh, incorporate mobility for everyone in the city. So I'm out of time, I'll leave it there. Answer any questions. Uh, Councillor Nag, thank you, Councillor Nag. Councillor Rather for questions. Yeah, just and this might be a little bit slightly off, but um, for point number three, is there any thought or consideration of like if we're eliminating the but buttons for modifying or amending that line to talk about um, audio, right? Because right now it's not a standard that all intersections or, or crosswalks have have that audible um and so i just wanted to make sure that we don't miss that so i don't know how just a friendly amendment to sort of a, say you know eliminating pedestrian buttons as part of improving traffic eliminating pedestrian buttons and including audio audio signals or yeah what are your thoughts to the mover <laughs> love it and as long as we figure out some wording, I'm I'm fully on board. I think that's a great a great catch. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, you muted yourself for some reason. Sorry, thank you. It's the end of the day on a Friday. I apologize. Uh, so yeah, I would just say the ability of reducing or eliminating pedestrian buttons, and increase and adding audio signals. A point of order okay. that might be incorrect in the, the intent might read incorrect. So it may be just a separate bullet point, making a new bullet point. Okay. As opposed to including and, because it might actually say and eliminate the. The yeah, ability yeah. of reducing or eliminating pedestrian buttons. Uh, let's see what the wording. Can, can, is Clerk adding that? Can, if you would just give us one moment, we'll put up the wording that Councillor Knack stated. Okay. And then uh, maybe we can take a look at where that best fits. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Councillor Rutherford, you that, have more questions? No, that was the only, I just wanted to make that slight amendment just because that's something I do get inquiries around. So that that was it and, and make sure we're being inclusive. If we're going to do changes to our light anyway, let's improve it that way. Okay, all right, any more questions, colleagues? Okay, Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. I was just wondering if we could instead put that in bullet three, put it on bullet four for the design practices, so to include all modes of transportation and accessibility. Just a thought to the mover. I'm sorry, this is to the mover? Councillor, yeah. yeah. Councillor Knack? I mean, it, it would technically be a question if Councilor Rutherford was making that amendment. Uh, I'm fine with, I know the intent, so I don't really care which way we do it. Um, uh, however, it best fits would be, uh, would be great on my books. Okay, maybe we'll get admin to weigh in on the amendment to the third bullet then. Yes. Uh, hi, hi, Councillor. Um, yeah, I think it's um, we we can add it in. We understand the intent behind looking at uh, increasing the audible signals um, um, at, at a lot of our signalized intersections. So uh, it's okay. We can we can make sure that we address that in the report. So it's okay to go into the, the third bullets. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, Councillor Wright. May I please just get confirmation? Is so confirming that that's a friendly and just confirming where we would like to have that audio signals. I heard a couple of different options in part three or in part four. Well, I don't know where would it fit. It Councillor Neck, Councillor Neck, can you do? Where do you think will fit better to be friendly? I, I think admin gets it either way, and so I, I, I truly don't think it makes a difference if we put in point three or point four. So whatever is the quickest way, I'm happy to do that. Okay. 
But in the meantime, while that's being done, I just have a quick question to administration. Uh, it is related to this. Maybe I'll ask Councilor Jans to take the chair. Right? Taken. And this is, I'm actually really looking forward to this work. So may this is more to probably to Stephanie on, uh, or maybe to Gord. Uh, the the work being done in the artificial intelligence sector, uh, I understand Edmonton is the third largest kind of a center for that kind of work. Uh, uh, very, very good work being done. So will this provide us an opportunity to organize, uh, like um, engage with the University of Alberta, with Amy and others, right, to uh, really look and work with them to have that kind of local people engaged in the AI sector? Uh, I would say potentially, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for sure, we could look at this as uh, parts of this components of this motion being perhaps a capital city pilot. Uh, we're doing capital city pilots with Edmonton Unlimited. Right. And that would allow us to tap into the AI community. And you're correct, we are the third best in the world in that yeah. space uh, with such talent at the University of Alberta. Yeah, because that will be good. They might have a lot of solutions, right, that can be looked at. Okay, good. All right. Is that part added now? Yes, we've added it to point three. And just, just to double check, and I apologize, Councillor Paquette seconded this motion? Uh, Councillor Paquette seconded that, Thank yeah. You. yeah. Okay, Councillor Rutherford, do you have more questions or to speak? If you have more questions, then I'll have to go to second round. Point of order. Okay, I just... Point of order. Oh, I sorry. Have, I have, I ask item and name, I have question. Okay. For the uh, first uh, round. Okay, can you sign up, Councillor? Uh, oh, we'll oh, we cannot we'll sign? We'll put you in the queue, one moment. Oh, please, yeah, okay. Here you go, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. So, I just want to understand better um, uh, for the point three, uh, maybe to the mover, uh, Councillor Nack. And in some area, and across city and then with busy traffic, this pedestrian buttons really helpful. If this motion we are going to pass, will not will that impact the pedestrian cross the busy street on a certain major road, and then as the necessary, they do need have that. Uh, pedestrian cross. Uh, uh, I just don't want to get clarified on that piece because uh, I heard in certain area they do have that concern. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, no, you, you, we couldn't actually eliminate them at every location. So a good example is probably what you just referenced. Sometimes you're going from a local road across an arterial road to another local road uh, that has a, a pedestrian activated traffic light. Uh, it's unlikely you would remove that button, uh, but what you might do is actually shorten the amount of wait time because some of those buttons can still take up to two minutes. And if you've got, uh, I have one close by and, and where there's two other lights that are on times and that might change every 45 seconds, yet the button that's pedestrian activated can still take up up to two minutes. So is there a way to shorten it as an example? So I, I, no, we wouldn't be um, removing that benefit to people. In fact, ideally, we'd be looking at ways to better synchronize those timings so that people don't have to wait as long. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And then my next question to administration. So for this, complete this review work, uh, is request additional resources or uh, additional budget? And then how is that current capacity to support this work? So, Council Rice, we would do this with uh, within our existing work program. We would schedule it in. Um, some of this has already been done as part of the previous pilot. So this would be uh, work that we would uh, initially do uh, with our uh, internal forces right now. Depending on what the outcomes are of the report, there might be subsequent work that would happen but that would be uh, something we would deal with once we had the report back in front of council 
and made some decisions on how we would go forward. Thank you. You already answered my next question. Um, actually, this is, a, uh, I know it's exciting, and then like Mayor so he mentioned, we can uh, actually leverage some AI uh, for that technology and look at this. So, but when the report come back, we don't know yet. So that may have some like financial implication of the new additional request. Potentially, it could, yeah. and I think as part of the motion says, uh, directs us to look at how we could uh, integrate with other uh, projects and programs that we have underway, so we would factor that in as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. That's my Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Salvador. Yep, um, I think this is great, very supportive. Um, just seeing the reference to um, identifying what's happening in other jurisdictions, I just wonder, uh, is there room within that report just to say what we're doing as well? I know that um, like the, the intelligent transportation system, smart roads, has been going on for a while. I just don't have a good handle on it, to be quite frank. Um, so I think it could just be valuable if some of that background is provided. Is that uh, Councillor, we would definitely okay. include current state, where Perfect. we're at, and what we've done in this in this field before. Wonderful. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have two minutes before five, so uh, this concludes the questions, though, right? So uh, if there's a long list to speak, then we might have to stop, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, to speak. I see no one to speak, so I'll go to Councillor Nack to close. Let's see if we can move traffic even more efficiently. There we That's go. my close. That's great. All right, so please vote. So I'm yes. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we have one more item, but we would have to stop here. So uh, that will uh, go to, that's 10.5, arterial road assessment. Uh, we'll go to next council meeting, right? Yes, March 14th. And uh, there's no issues about? No, that one can be laid over at okay. uh, once, yep. Okay, Councilor Neck. Yeah, my understanding is that uh, this the due date for this would be closer in Q4. So I think even if this gets approved, that's probably enough time from admin to still report back in Q4. So okay. I don't think there's any problem laying it over. Okay, got it. All right. Uh, any notice of motions or motions without customary notice? Seeing none, it's Friday. We're done, right at five o'clock. <laughs>